Well, First colleagues, things. I think we can start. Uh, dear colleagues, I, well, I wouldn't say that I warmly welcome you today, so I coolly welcome you today, <laughs> all those who are here and those who are following us uh, from, um, uh, on live uh, from Supreme Audit Institution worldwide. So welcome to everybody. Uh, and thank you for coming. Please know that this conference will be held in English without interpretation. And I, will, will, I would like now to invite our president, Klaus Heinelena, to start the conference. Klaus Heinelena. Thank you very much, Daniel. Dear colleagues, dear friends, I am honored as president of the European Court of Auditors to welcome you here. And particularly our guests from the Supreme Court Audit Institutions of France, Sweden, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and the United States of America. It's great to have you all here with us bringing your experience to the table. I also want to pay tribute to Daniela Mark and Eva Lindström for representing our college here today in this conference. Daniel, we are all extremely grateful for you representing us in the working group of INTUSAI, which produced the guidelines you will discuss today. Your initiative in setting up today's event is an excellent one. In some of your jurisdictions, Supreme Audit Institutions already have extensive experience in evaluating public policies and programs. In the EU context, I believe, however, that we are only at the beginning it is a gradual process and there is still much to do. Our main auditee, the European Commission, has made interesting advances in its budget proposal this year. It now publishes a performance overview for each policy field. Here at the court, we are increasing our focus on performance through our many special reports and through our new annual report on performance. And we are giving our auditors the specialized skills necessary for policy evaluation through a partnership with the University of Lorraine. Ladies and gentlemen, just because 100% of the available public money has been spent and 100% of contracts have been signed, that does not mean that anything useful has necessarily happened. Citizens expect they deserve to know the impact, the added value of this funding, and we can play a decisive role in finding this out. I wish you all a very successful conference. Thank you, President, and uh, welcome again to all those in this room and to uh, those following online from uh, their side. Well, this aim of this conference is to discuss between colleagues how auditors can help in demonstrating to citizens and stakeholders which results are achieved with public money. We believe that this is a particularly interesting topic in which more and more citizens and institutions are interested and engaging. Why? Size usually consider performance audit uh, in the definition of their mandate. Public policies and program evaluations are also part of our missions and deserve particular attention for several reasons. First, evaluation helps to respond to citizens' expectations who want to know whether po positive results are achieved with public money. Two, evaluation contributes to improving decision making by analyzing what works and why. Three, evaluation have already been successfully performed by size and guidelines adopted by InterSci will have uh, a presentation about that in a, in a moment. So, SIs are well placed to perform evaluations and introdu introduce evaluation techniques in our performance audits because we are independent, we have or can develop evaluation methodology knowledge, and of course, we have knowledge of public policies and administrative organization. During this conference, we will exchange practical experiences and knowledge between colleagues regarding the size mandate, methodology, and implementation of evaluations and evaluation techniques and methodologies. Panel experts will also share a number of practical examples because the better knowing by exchanging with colleagues and improving our practice by seeing what, what other people do. We therefore invite all participants 
present here, as well as colleagues who are following us live in their site. To participate in the discussion that follow the panel presentation, please don't hesitate to ask questions to people here who, who came to our court today. Indeed, the panelists are also invited to participate in these discussions. So we have the pleasure and honor to have among us colleagues from a wide range of size, and I would like to warmly thank them for their presence. So, well, I would, like, I would now like to invite Mr. Negre, com coming from the French Court of Auditors, in charge of the working group, InterSci Working Group and Evaluation, to uh, present an overview and presentation of InterSci Guideline 9400, uh, on the topic we discussed today, and which was adopted by Incosci in 2016. Mr. Negre is chargé de mission at the Directorate of International Relations in the French Court and Francophonie at the French Court of Auditors, and the French Court of Auditors is presiding the InterSci Working Group on the Evaluation of Public Policies and Standards since its inception in 1992. Mr. Negre. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Lamarck. Um, I would like to <clears throat> I would like to uh, give you the greetings uh, of from the French Sci um, and the WGEPP, which the French Cour des Comptes is uh, chairing. Sorry, I will just yeah. is chairing. Um, I would like to thank you for your invitation today. Um, to the SEA, and I would like to thank also Mr. President, Mr. Lenné, for its invitation, his invitation. Uh, inviting the French Cour des Comptes to um, participate to this, um, to this seminar uh, shows the great interest and the, uh, the, the interest of the evaluation process within the international community of size. My presence here gives me also the occasion to convey to you the greetings of uh, First President Didier Migaud, who is grateful to the ACA and to all the members of the ACA for their invitation and the interest in the question of uh, public policy evaluation. <clears throat> uh, before, um, I'm, before I will present the InterSci Gov 9400, let me give you a quick uh, overview of the WGEPP, which produced the InterSci Gov 9400. The Working Group on Evaluation was created in 1992, as Mrs. Lamarck said, and um, at a time when evaluation, the theme of evaluation, was becoming more and more important in France and internationally. The 80s and the, 90, the early 90s were, a decade, were decades where uh, first evaluation practices were developed in France, but also in other countries, such as the USA and New Zealand in particular. The French Sci have been chaired the InterSci Working Group on Evaluation since its inceptions, and it belongs to the third goal of knowledge sharing from the InterSci. The, uh, the Working Group held annual meetings, focusing on exchanging good practices on program evaluation and policy, uh, public policy evaluation, and also collecting and disseminating those information through um, within the size. <clears throat> In, uh, so the, the working group has been adopted the document that we will discuss today, the InterSci Gov 9400, that I will call the InterSci Gov for to be uh, clearer. Um, and the working group uh, last met in Vilnius in uh, May uh, this year. This, uh, this is the map uh, of the members of and observers of the WGEPP. As you can see, this is a broad range of country. Um, you have two countries in blue, which are the new member that joined the WGEPP this year. Uh, the Indian Sai and the ECA, and we thank the ECA for joining the group uh, this year. <clears throat> so what are the InterSci Gov 9400? Um, they were adopted in 2016 uh, during the Abu Dhabi um, InCOSI, and the goal of those uh, guidelines is not to establish a new standard, 
uh, within the Intosai, uh, uh, a new Intosai standard. It's not a doctrinal, it's not a scientific view uh, of what should be obeyed or strictly, f strictly followed. It's rather, uh, um, it's, rather, it's rather defining the main characteristic of evaluation process and uh, giving, you, giving a framework for this evaluation process. My presentation will follow closely the structure of the document in order to present the major uh, element of it. <clears throat> Here you can have an overview of what, of what an evaluation is. Uh, those are the major steps of an evaluation that will we discuss throughout the whole presentation. <clears throat> but what is an evaluation of public policy? A public policy evaluation is an examination aiming at analyzing five different, different items. First, the objectives of a public policy, which is the, one of the specificities of the public policy evaluation. Then it also analyzes the implementation of this public policy, the, um, the inputs um, that, that we will call the inputs. It will also analyzes, analyze the um, outputs of the, present, of the public policy, which are the direct and immediate effects of uh, the implementation of a policy, the outcomes, and the impacts. At the difference of, uh, dif uh, different from the performance audit, uh, an evaluation of public policy focus also on uh, three particular um, items that are the, the relationship between um, between either the objective, the needs, or the impact of a public policy. First of all, it will focus on the relevance of a policy. That is to say, it will question the validity, the uh, validity and the legitimacy of a public policy by asking and challenging the adequacy between objectives and the needs that the policy wants to meet. The public policy evaluation also focuses on the utility and question the utility of a policy. That is to say, it is questioning the worthwhileness of a policy and will discuss the adequacy between the effects and the needs. And finally, an evaluation is also questioning the external coherence of a policy. That is to say, this its global consistency with other policies. Here is a figure where you, can ha where you have all the different items that are analyzed during an evaluation of public policy. In dark blue, you have all the elements that are analyzed uh, in both the performance audit and the evaluation of public policy. So you find here the objective, the inputs, the outputs, and the outcomes of a policy. You also find the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness the relations that between those items that are analyzed through a performance audit. And in light blue, you will find all the elements that are specific to the public policy evaluation. Um, in order to understand better what this uh, graph is about, let me give you an example here. Um, the anti-smoking policy uh, report that was published uh, by the Cour des Comptes in 2012 <clears throat> Here we can have a, we have an example of um, of this uh, figure that I was showing you uh, before. For instance, what is the needs that we want to tackle? We want to reduce cancer mortality. One of the program, one of the objective that we can find, is improving the risk awareness of uh, smoking. In order to do so, we can launch several. Uh, campaign, awareness campaign, with, through ads or through um, uh, campaigns in schools, for instance. The direct effect and immediate effect would be an increase in risk awareness, which will lead to a medium, short, um, uh, a medium term effect, which will be a decrease in tobacco consumption, which will lead in a direct, direct impact, which will be a longer impact, a drop in lungs cancer. Um, but this, uh, this policy or this program would have an indirect effect, which will be the crisis in the tobacco selling sector. So we have to ask ourselves, is the objective relevant to the need? Is the, um, the impact are, uh, useful? Are the, is the policy useful to reach 
the impact and to reach the, the, uh, the needs that we are uh, looking for. And we have to ask ourselves also, is the policy coherent with other public policy that the country and is, um, is, uh, is implementing? However, it is crucial for the evaluator not to go as far as to prescribe a policy orientation. As you all know, the evaluator is not a policy maker. When uh, the evaluation process questions the objective of a public policy, it has to be careful not to go as far as, as to uh, prescribing a new policy orientation. How do we prevent that? Um, by first maintaining the independence of the side. This is one of the most important issues that is raised in this document. Um, we have also to issue non-binding recommendation, but you all know that, of course, we don't issue uh, non-binding uh, recommendation. As a matter of fact, an evaluation of public policy is a neutral and fact-based contribution to public uh, and, demo and democratic debate. It's not a uh, it's not a it doesn't uh, orient a policy, it doesn't um, create a new policy. Now that we have defined what is uh, policy uh, evaluation, let me uh, have a quick look, let's have an overview of the actors of the evaluation of public policy. If the size are not the only actors of, an ev of the evaluation, um, of course, we have a different actor that can, uh, that can lead and that can conduct uh, evaluations of public policy, for instance, universities, private firms, uh, administrative administration, internal administrations, um, third parties also. Um, so if the size are not the only actors, uh, we consider that the size are the natural actors to conduct public policy evaluation. Why is that? Mostly, uh, thanks to three uh, reasons. First, the independence of the SAI, which is uh, necessary to conduct the uh, public policy evaluation. Then, uh, the SAI have access to methodological knowledge and can develop this methodological knowledge. It can uh, reach to data that is not available to other, uh, to other uh, body, for instance, university, or for instance, private consulting firms. And uh, the size have also access to, to an accumulated knowledge, to an internal accumulated knowledge from their past size and from the uh, public sector that they have been auditing for, um, for a long time now. So size are objective and independent institutions from both government and private interest. And that is why, in our opinion, the size are the main uh, actor, or not the main, but the natural actor, if I say so. <clears throat> um, a relationship that has to be discussed as well uh, when conducting an evaluation is the relationship with the sponsor when, sponsor, when there is one. Um, most of the time, the size uh, can carry their own, their, uh, the evaluation on their own initiative. But it can happen from time to time that a sponsor can ask, can request a site to give, uh, to carry out an evaluation. A sponsor is a public authority, parliament, or the executive that requests uh, a site to do so. It is important that this relation with the sponsor is uh, constructive. And in doing so, the site must dialogue, dialogue with the sponsor to determine the scope, the object, and the evaluation question that the, the sponsor wants the site to ask and want the site to uh, consider while um, conducting the evaluation. However, the SAI should decide and has to decide on its own uh, on the scope and the process of the evaluation. The SAI, as we said before, is an independent body and in that uh, sense it has to decide on its own um, about, it has to decide on its own the scope and the whole process. It has also the final word in the drafting and the publication of the conclusion of the report. Um, our document also highlights the fact that if a SAI um, thinks that the request from a sponsor can threaten its independence, a SAI can go as far as uh, refusing to conduct an evaluation. 
that is um, the, the job of the evaluability assessment to determine if the independence should be threatened. Now that all the actors have been identified, it is time to choose the object of the evaluation. What are we going to evaluate? Um, there are three main criteria to determine what is the uh, object of a public policy evaluation. First of all, the object, the policy that we will evaluate should be important enough, should be significant enough. How do we characterize this importance? First of all, it would be the size of its budget. The budget should be a significant portion of, uh, it should be a significant uh, one. Then we have to uh, identify the stakeholder. The stakeholder should be important enough, significant enough. We have to also look at the scopes of anticipated effects, the complexity and also the symbolic importance or within the public opinion. For instance, now at the Cour des Comptes, we are conducting an evaluation of public policy on dra driving safety. This is a symbolic important, uh, of symbolic importance within France uh, because there was some backlash uh, following a reform in France from the government in reducing speed limits um, uh, in, in France. So we know that this particular item, this particular policy will be of significant, uh, of symbolic importance. There are, however, two pitfalls to avoid when choosing the policy to evaluate. We shouldn't select a policy which is too general, too large, too broad. Uh, for instance, the taxing policy on its own, it's, not, uh, it's, uh, it's, way, it's way too uh, general and way too large to be evaluated. And we will also have to avoid a too specific program because we, we, we have to have, as we said, a size of a, an, importance, uh, an important policy, which means that the size of the budget should be uh, big enough, should be complex enough, etc. So uh, a too specific program wouldn't fit those criteria. Another criteria would be um, to uh, have a measurability of the different effects of the policy. We have to identify what are the different effects a policy can uh, have, can produce. By doing so, we have to map those different uh, effects and we have to highlight the distinction that exists between all those different effects. In order to do so, we're constructing such a chart, such a, such a chart uh, which can help the evaluator team, evaluation team, sorry, um, to uh, identify which are which. We have to, uh, to distinguish short terms from long term effects that we call outcomes and impacts. We have to distinguish also intended from unexpected effects and we have also to identify perceived <coughs> from objective effects. Finally, the third criteria to uh, keep in mind when uh, choosing the object of an evaluation is the period of time to launch the policy, the evaluation of the policy. A public policy evaluation can be launched at three different times, as, as you know, an ex-ante evaluation, an ongoing evaluation, which will, which will be concomitant to the evaluation, or can be an ex-post evaluation. It is our uh, understanding, it, it is our opinion that an ex post evaluation should be um, more, uh, should be uh, the, 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 sorry, sorry, should be chosen. Why is that? Because an ex post evaluation will give an avail availability of sufficient data, it will avoid all the provisional results, and it will also give us long terms and indirect effects. If we study an ongoing evaluation during the uh, implementation of a public policy, all those elements would be uh, would be absent. So it is. Uh, we usually consider that the period of two to three years after the launch of a public policy should be um, would be enough to have all those uh, long-term and direct effects. <clears throat> we have now to identify who are the stakeholders that which will be uh, involved throughout the whole evaluation process. 
this is one of the key specificities of the public policy evaluation, which is the involvement of the stakeholder within the um, evaluation process. Those stakeholders are, are actors in, uh, of the policy or who are direct beneficiaries. So they're either decision makers, operators, founders, or beneficiaries, direct or indirect. Here we have a, a, a figure that shows all those different actors, executive authorities, public, uh, public entities, elected local representatives, private entities, which can be NGOs, businesses, associations of beneficiaries, etc. Here is another example of a French report on uh, social housing policy. Uh, this is a mapping of the stakeholders. And you can see that we uh, divided them in three main groups, like four here, but uh, that can be defined as, as three main groups, policy founders and decision makers, policy operators, and beneficiaries, so direct and indirect beneficiaries. Doing so uh, while uh, uh, building the project uh, of the evaluation, identifying the stakeholders is important because they will be part of the whole evaluation process and in, order to, in, uh, in that sense, they should be identified prior to the launch of the uh, evaluation. There are, however, some uh, limitations when identifying the stakeholders. First of all, when constituting that list, a SI should be careful not to uh, forget any major uh, stakeholder. If, do, if, if so, the all uh, accuracy of the public policy evaluation would be threatened and would be questionable, what we, would be questioned. The list shouldn't be too long uh, also because having a too long list is not manageable because as we will see later, those stakeholders will have to gather uh, throughout the whole process. So having a list that is too long would not be manageable. The SI should uh, adopt a constructive attitude towards the stakeholders and to keep in mind that the stakeholders should do, uh, have a role within the process. Um, so they have to be involved in, a way, in many ways. The objective of the evaluation is not as a performance audit to reveal the dysfunction of a public policy or a program, but rather to, um, to, to improve a policy by uh, questioning and challenging the objectives and uh, th um, questioning the relevance and the utility of this uh, policy. The SAI has to maintain its independence, as we said before, from the stakeholders and all the sponsors uh, lobbying. And finally, the SAI has to ensure the confidentiality of the evaluation process. So now that the object have been uh, chosen, the policy have been to evaluate has been chosen, it is time to conduct the public policy evaluation. How are we doing that? There are three different steps. Uh, the first one would be to conduct an evaluability assessment. This is one of the specificity from the, of the evaluation of public policy compared to the performance audit. An evaluability assessment considers the feasibility of an evaluation and addresses all the issues and questions that can be raised by the evaluation. As you can see on the figure on your right, you have all the different items that an evaluability assessment should focus on and should question. It should define the object, the scope, the methodology that will be used during the evaluation process. It has to identify the evaluation questions that will be asked to <clears throat> the different stakeholders throughout the whole process. It has also to identify who will be the stakeholders and what, allocation, what resources will be allocated to this uh, evaluation process. All those elements have to be defined prior to the launch of the evaluation process within this, during this evaluability assessment. This evaluability assessment leads eventually to the, to the drafting of an evaluation planning memorandum that will determine the framework, the framework of the evaluation. However, it is important to keep in mind that if the evaluability assessment conclude that it's not desirable to conduct a policy evaluation, then the, sh the, poli the evaluation should not be carried out. If the evaluability assessment consider that there is not 
uh, resource, uh, there is not a sufficient allocation of resources, there is not sufficient data available, or the stakeholders are not um, mobilized, uh, cannot be mobilized, then the evaluation should non shouldn't be carried out. Instead, a performance audit could maybe be carried out, as it has a, a, a narrower uh, scope. <clears throat> an, evaluation, uh, an evaluation of public policy have also an organization of its own. There are three different bodies uh, that will be uh, involved with, uh, in the evaluation process. First, there is the team of evaluators. That is to say, the members of the SAI, the permanent member of the SAI, that will conduct the evaluation. This team, uh, those evaluators, can be joined by, temporary ex uh, by experts that can be temporarily hired uh, by the SAI or uh, on areas that, are, um, that the evaluation wants to focus on. Uh, supervising this team of evaluators, we have the supervisory body, which uh, gives the final opinion and validates uh, the evaluability assessments and the different uh, reports uh, throughout the whole contradictory process that will, 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 that will lead to the publication of the final report. And finally, and we will focus a little bit on this particular body, we have the advisory body. This body is a consultative and mixed body of evaluators and stakeholders. This is a specificity of the public policy evaluation. This body follows the work of the evaluation team throughout the whole evaluation process. So they gather during the evaluation process several times to discuss either the findings, the results, the interim reports, and they give their opinion and their observation on all those um, questions. Uh, they discuss the interim and the final report and they also give their opinion on the recommendation the evaluation team uh, come with. It is important to keep in mind here as well that the decisions and the observations of the advisory, bo advisory body are not uh, binding the evaluation team. So the evaluation team should listen to those observations from the advisory body but uh, should uh, draft a uh, report uh, that is independently uh, drafted and which uh, f that will uh, summarize the opinion of the SAI and not of any particular stakeholders. <clears throat> In order to, uh, to find, uh, to carry out the evaluation, uh, the SAI can use several tools and methodology to find the data uh, necessary to uh, conduct the evaluation. Those are the different uh, tools and methodology that can be used, review of literature, international benchmarks, uh, pre-existing database analysis, um, comparative court studies, qualitative and quantitative surveys, and of course, past audit um, results that uh, can be necessary and can be interesting to analyze uh, when carrying out an evaluation. As I said before, experts can also be recruited during the evaluation process if um, they are needed. It is important to keep in mind also that the, those experts have to follow and abide by the same professional uh, obligation and standards as permanent size member. Now that the, uh, the evaluation has been conducted, it is time to analyze the results of the evaluation and to come out with a report, final report. This uh, finalization of results uh, um, is produced through a, contract, a contract, contract, contradictory process, sorry. Uh, so there are several steps uh, to conduct this, um, this finalization of results, and it goes, and go, it goes with uh, the, the three bodies that we discussed uh, earlier. So, the interim reports are uh, drafted by the evaluation team and they are subjected to exchanges with the advisory body, as we said. Then the team of evaluators draft a final report that will be submitted to the supervisory body that will accept or not the recommendation and the conclusions of the evaluation team. 
Then we reach the clearing stage, uh, which is the presentation of this draft report to the advisory body. And uh, during that stage, the evaluation team and the, sorry, the stakeholders are asked and are invited to comment on this final uh, report and to give their opinion on the different recommendations. As I said, uh, those observations are included in the final report, but shouldn't be binding the evaluation team. Finally, a final report is issued. It is an independent opinion of the size finding analysis conclusions and recommendation. As I said, those recommendations are non-binding, fact-based, and are only possible orientation for the policymaker and not uh, binding. Here is an example of uh, the mapping of the different opinions of the stakeholders during the social housing policy evaluation. You have here uh, the different stakeholders, uh, one to eight, and the different uh, recommendation, one to 15 and we map the different uh, um, observations of the uh, stakeholders, green being totally agree, and uh, yellow being partially agree, and red would be don't agree. <clears throat> when those results are, uh, are published, this uh, report is disseminated to and aimed at the various stakeholders, decision makers, operators, and beneficiaries, of course, the author of the requested evaluation, when relevant, when a sponsor is uh, asking a site to conduct an evaluation, and of course, the public opinion. As we said, an evaluation of public policy is a contribution to public and democratic debate. So the public opinion should be one of the main um, target of this report. It is important to keep in mind, finally, that there are three pitfalls to avoid when, uh, with the use of the result. The size bears no re direct responsibility for the decision made uh, following the, the publication of the report. The size maintains its independence every time, and the size avoid any interference in the decision-making process. As a conclusion, um, it has been three years now that those uh, Intersigov 9400 have been implemented. During the last uh, meeting of the WGEPP in Vilnius in May this year, we asked this very uh, this question of the implementation of the Intersigov. <clears throat> in order to do so, the WGEPP uh, launched a questionnaire and carried out a questionnaire um, among the different size. <clears throat> of the working group and uh, we got 14 answers that gave us uh, an overview of uh, the, the implementation of those, uh, of, those um, of this framework. This questionnaire is still being carried out so I'm, I'm, I am asking all the sites that haven't answered uh, to this questionnaire to please uh, answer this questionnaire. For instance, uh, let's do a little bit of name and shame. Uh, for instance, the USA haven't answered this uh, questionnaire, so please, if you can uh, tell your colleague uh, that. And also, I think Sweden have, hasn't uh, answered this questionnaire. So please, as well, uh, can you uh, pass this word? Because this questionnaire will be included in the upcoming OECD report, on the evaluation of public policy within the OECD countries. So we would be uh, grateful for all uh, sides uh, to answer this uh, questionnaire. Uh, what uh, did we find uh, thanks to this questionnaire? We found out that if not all member sides are carrying out evaluation per se, there are an undeniable dynamic towards its development. Um, the development of performance audit with evaluative scope, with an evaluative scope, uh, is seen for us as a step towards evaluation of public policy. Among those, uh, among the side that uh, that conduct performance audit with an evaluative scope, most of the sides are using the InterSIGOV as a framework. So by uh, doing those performance audit with an evaluative scope, those, invis those evaluative investigation, if we can name them like that, um, we can see that most of the many sites are trying to involve stakeholders, are also conducting evaluability assessment. So we are witnessing that this document, this framework, is being used even when the site is not carrying, carrying out an evaluation per se. 
So what's next now for this document? Um, the WGEPP meeting in Vilnius agreed on opening uh, to modification this document to be redrafted for the and sufficiently detailed topic to be redrafted. So there is a call for proposal to uh, find uh, possible improvements uh, in this document. Current ones are the modification of the title to include the mention program uh, in order to have a broader and larger scope uh, for, for member size that not all, not, not all of them conduct poly, public policy evaluation but some conduct program uh, evaluation. Uh, we would also include a mention of the follow-up of evaluation recommendation because for now this uh, item is not uh, included in the document. And finally, uh, we will also develop the part uh, about the involvement of the stakeholders. We will have an enlarged definition of them we will also question the ethics and add some uh, elements about the confidentiality and the level of representativeness within the advisory body. I thank you all for your attention. It was very uh, <laughs> consistent, I know. Uh, but uh, thank you all for your attention and uh, I'm glad to take your questions if you have some. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Negre. Well, so after the Gov, the adoption by Incosci 2016 of Gov 9400 was certainly an important step for demonstrating that SIs have the capacity and willingness to perform evaluations. So thanks to the French Court of Auditors and all the members of the working group and the very important involvement of some SIs represented here. I think it was important for size to demonstrate that they can go beyond uh, performance audit and develop new methodologies for assessing the outcomes and impacts of public policies uh, and analyze uh, how what works a, a, and why. So that was important. I, I would mention, but of course you notice that, that it's, they are guidelines and not standards. That's important, we know that, we're familiar with that in the uh, European Court of Auditors since we are Vice President of the InterSci Professional Standards Committee. So guidelines here, no standards. Well, it's not, it's not for, forbidden to have standards for evaluation. Some countries have, including France, Switzerland, and others. Uh, so it means that for InterSci, we don't have to define precise standards for that, not compulsory standards. But, but uh, evaluation of programs and public policies are mainly a, a matter of methodology, uh, the way to, to, to consider things, to address issues, uh, etc. So that's, uh, that's important to note that. And to note too that the Gov guidelines it means that evaluation is not only the responsibility of Supreme Audit Institution, it's not only the responsibility of auditors, but it means that institutionalization of evaluation in a country involves many actors like government evaluation societies, supreme audit institutions, universities, private firms, and uh, the, the involves the development of a uh, evaluation culture and performance culture in, in a country. So that, that's important. Well, I will now open the floor to question and I have some questions from size uh, outside to, 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 to this panel too. Are there questions on this presentation? Yes? Thank you, very, very interesting presentation. Um, still, a little bit puzzling about the difference between performance audit and evaluation. Uh, um, maybe you could, uh, I th you provided attention to it in your presentation, but could you perhaps in a, in a few points indicate where, f in your uh, opinion, the, the main difference is between an evaluation and the performance audit? Well, thank you. Maybe other people can uh, respond to It's a usual question from auditors. Uh, what, uh, how, what we do is performance auditing. What is evaluation compared to performance auditing? There are some, some answers to that. Benjamin Negre and maybe other, other people. 
<clears throat> Thank you for your question. Um, the main uh, differences between performance audit and uh, evaluation are the scopes of the, uh, the process, the audit. Um, if a uh, performance audit focuses on the efficiency, effectiveness and economy of a program, um, the public policy evaluation goes as far as questioning the objective of this, uh, uh, this uh, public policy, which is to say that um, it, uh, it questions the relevance of the policy. Is the uh, policy legitimate? Is the policy um, useful? to tackle and to meet the, uh, the needs of, uh, of the, um, the country or the, the government wants to, to, to tackle. So the, in that sense, the SAI is going as far as to questioning the policy orientation of the government, which is one of the element uh, difference. Uh, if I understand correctly, so it means that you question whether the, p the policy is the right answer to the question that it aims to answer. Okay. Yeah, so evaluation, especially for public policies, are addressing the problems for a society, not only a program launched by the government or public authorities to address one issue. Well, the, the question of mobility, for instance, we had a crisis, a social crisis recently in France. People don't live where they work because it's very expensive to, to live in some cities because they are improving, it's very nice to, to, to live in, but the, the, the price for real estate have increased dramatically. So they go outside, and especially because in France they like to have their houses, gardens, etc. So they have to drive a lot to go to their work, so it's a problem. For, um, if you want to address that, you can consider that from different points of view. What can you do for housing? Will you help them? Is, there, is, is it necessary to have a public intervention for that? What do you do for mobility? Will you uh, allow them to have public transportation for either for free or for, for limited prices, etc.? Et How do you consider envi environmental issues, considering that when they take their cars, um, of course there, is a, there are problems for the quality, for air quality and so on, <laughs> So this the question is for public uh, health. So you have different issues. That, that's why I, I would prefer to speak of problems in the society more than needs, because needs is something that um, doesn't cover all the question of the, uh, uh, in the in the society. So there are a different kind different kind of problems with objectives, public objectives that can be conflicting each other. So if you want to um, develop the protection of the environment and address climate change uh, that the government did, increasing taxes on, on, on oil so that people cannot afford because they are very just already in their, in their wages and they spend a lot of money to go to their work. So you have different policies, including different policies, including different objectives which are conflicting. Same for driving security. Uh, you will, of course, find people uh, driving too fast, but they will tell you, well, we have to drive faster because we have to go to our work, so we cannot accept a limit in the, in the, in the driving, in driving speed. So many of the issues, and especially with environment, environment, uh, you will decide to improve the quality of air, but there are some industries uh, that are, have damage, are damaging for that. Or transportation, you have to transport goods. What will you do? Will you, will you continue to use uh, trucks or uh, try to develop trains? So comparing uh, audit performance audit to policy evaluation means that you are able to address complex public policies with conflicting objectives and not only focus on the performance of a service of a program included in the, in the commission, for instance. So it means that auditors have to go to see beyond to, to address the complexity of public policies, uh, to try to analyze this complexity, to be aware of the priorities of public, uh, of public policies and to consider that it's not, all, not only a question of management and designing programs, it's the question of the complexity of society and um, awareness of problems that only public authorities can solve. 
Uh, and that's, of course, that's complex, but it's uh, the only way you can answer the, the, the expectation of citizens and show them that things are complex and some public choices uh, maybe are not well accepted by people. Uh, many, many poor people smoke, but if you raise the, the price of tobacco, they will not accept that, but you do that, not, you do that because you consider that uh, smoking is not good for, for health, can develop cancers not only of lungs but of heart to uh, heart disease, etc. Uh, so that, there is a question of priorities for, for public authorities. And that means that for auditors, it's not only considering a program or performance indicators, but considering the complexity uh, of, the, of the society. And for that, the only way you can address that is not only analyzing outputs or outcomes, is trying to understand why something works or not. Will people accept to reduce their speed in their cars? Possibly, but possibly not. They will not, they will not like that. Will judges and policemen accept to find them or consider that well, you can understand that it's not may, maybe it's not very serious, etc. What will they do? Will they sanction or, or let it let it go? And people are considering that, for instance, when they have to pay, is it only for giving money to the government or to trying to 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 make them reduce their speed and finding them for that? So that's addressing this complexity of the society, in a society which is more and more complex, and where there are more and more uncertainty, because we very often, in fact, people don't accept expertise and don't accept that public authorities impose them uh, some, some behavior or something to do. Um, maybe there are other answers within the panel about uh, this question, which is one of the key question that auditor will ask. Well, we, we do performance audit. Why uh, should we do evaluation? What is different from our usual work? Yes. Thank you for your reply. I think the, those elements that you mentioned are very important. And I don't think we should go into a, a very detailed discussion about the difference between performance audit and evaluation because I wanted to add that I think that I'm not an expert on the SAI um, uh, inter -SI guidelines. I have to admit I only work at the SAI for a year now, but my impression is because I'm quite an expert in evaluating effectiveness, effectiveness, effectiveness and efficiency that, the, that the, there's room in the guidelines for performance audit to have a lot of those aspects that you just mentioned. But um, I think the important thing is that we both agree that those are very, the complexity and the uncertainty and the conflicting policies are very important issues that should be addressed. I have two questions from uh, Spain and South Africa. First question for Mr. Negre. Will Gov 9400 be further developed? Will there be new developments for this Gov? Will there be practical and concrete guidance on how this Gov can be used in practice? You started to give some answers with what you consider to be um, improved or amended in uh, after Incosai Brazil uh, 2022. So maybe you could be more precise about this change in Gov uh, 9400. Yeah, thank you. Um, regarding the improvement of the current document that uh, will be discussed within the next work plan of the WGEPP uh, for 2020 to 2022, um, there are some um, issues that will be highlighted and um, this is the objective of the working group to give cases of studies and to give uh, practical examples of what uh, public policy, um, what are the different evaluation that the size are carrying out. Um, this is definitely uh, something that we could do having some practical example within the document even though uh, there are guidelines so there should be a framework so quite general but uh, we could also uh, give some examples I would invite all the present size and listening size uh, on the internet to go on the website of the WGEPP uh, which I will uh, maybe give to uh, the ECA for you to be able to to go on um, in order to see all the past presentation that have been uh, 
that have been presented during the different seminars of the WGEPP for you to have some practical uh, example of evaluations. Thank you. More question in the room? No, I have a second. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very short practical question. There, there, there are sometimes the, the, uh, the example, the anti-corruption strategy. This is the, the, the program which is uh, which not requires the, the, the uh, public funds. This is only generally a legislative concept. And um, the first question, how evaluate such programs which are not uh, financed, but only this is the complex of legislative uh, plans. Uh, and sometimes there is situation that uh, there is program like anti-corruption strategy, which was not officially closed, but the, there is new government which is not interested to to, to, to implement this, this concept because the, the new government has different approach for for this question, and uh, what is your refl reflection? Uh, in the Thank you very much. Yeah, all the answers about that's key question. In fact, two questions: How can we evaluate uh, the outcomes of a policy? Is the main issue in evaluation of the question of causality? What are the factors that brought change? Uh, can you analyze that? Is it a change in mentalities? Is it sanction? Is it the policy? Is it other factors? So the key issue for evaluation is trying to analyze what were the factors that were uh, in fact relevant and that brought change, uh, which is very often very difficult to, 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 to do. Your second question is what about changes in policy? Um, instability in public policy is one of the, of the, of the main concerns, the key issues for evaluation because it's very difficult to, um, uh, if you, you don't have some con relevance, consistency in the policy, it's difficult to, 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 to track, to analyze what are the, the results. But maybe there are answers here, comments within the panel about these two, these two issues, about anti-corruption strategies, and uh, and changes um, in the in the, in public policies. Are there experience about that, Benjamin Nagel? Um, regard, I don't know if it's, it will um, answer your question precisely, but uh, to give an example of what the Cour des Comptes is currently doing now is uh, taking part in the um, broader um, question of anti-corruption uh, policy among both uh, the OEF, so the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, and also uh, following the foreign ministry uh, uh, willingness to tackle this issue. So we are uh, uh, we are part of those two uh, diff different uh, seminars, uh, different um, uh, bodies that are uh, questioning uh, and analyzing those questions of anti-corruption uh, strategy. So in those bodies, we are not the only one. We have all the uh, different actors that can uh, be involved in this, uh, in the study or in the anti-corruption strategy. So it will be the uh, Autorité contre la, la corruption, uh, Autorité de la transparence, the Transparency Authority, the Anti-Corruption Authority, uh, Parliament, of course. So all those uh, bodies are gathering together to uh, tackle those, e those uh, issues. But uh, I don't think we have a proper evaluation on this uh, strategy. Thank you very much, Mr. Potan. So wants to to that. In the, in the United States, we recently at uh, GAO, we pr uh, generated something called the Fraud Risk Management Framework. Um, and while fraud is not necessarily exactly the same thing as corruption, there's a lot of uh, relationship between the two. And based on the Fraud Risk Management Framework, which we set up a process for assessing fraud, assessing fraud tolerances, figuring out fraud-related plans, um, Congress actually took action and, and created a law called the Fraud Reduction and Data Analytics Act. Uh, which incorporated a lot of our framework into the law, and we're now working on implementation 
um, across the U.S. government um, of programs intended to identify um, and reduce fraud. So part of that implementation process now is we're coming up with better strategies for risk assessments. We're coming up with better strategies for estimating kind of the overall prevalence that's, that's occurring and the impact of that prevalence. That work is still fairly nascent um, in our context, but we've got a lot of it going on and we're really using that law as a good standard upon which to build that kind of analysis and evaluation. Thank you. I, had, I had a second question from South Africa about ongoing evaluation. Well, people can understand ex ante, ex post, but there is very often ambiguity between ongoing and ex post evaluation. So, are different evaluation techniques used for ongoing evaluation? What would be the difference between the monitoring function exercised by management and the ongoing evaluation made by the external auditor? In other words, is ongoing evaluation only a matter of monitoring, indicators for monitoring uh, the, uh, an, evalu an ongoing policy, or are there specific techniques and methodologies for, for doing that? Are there answers from Mr. Negre or other people in the panel? Yes, Emmanuel Sangra. Thank you for this question. It has a link with the uh, former question about when they're changing in policies. So uh, ongoing evaluation in Switzerland, I will give the example of Switzerland. We do have uh, long-term legislation. We have not so many changements. Of course, when you have a lot of changement in legislation, you do an evaluation take some time, a minimal one year, but in some countries you can have two changes in one year. In Switzerland we, do have, we don't have so many changes, so it's better for doing evaluation. You have to, to have a, a certain lapse of time to do evaluation. And uh, as uh, Benjamin said, uh, three years after the policy you can measure better than in the one year or two years after. But if the legislation changes continuously, it's no use to make an evaluation. But you can compare between one legislation and the second legislation. And ongoing evaluation, we don't do that in Switzerland because evaluation takes time, so we do, are not so useful when we do evaluation um, on, in the same time as the policies being involved. So there, then we do, at the Swiss Audit Office, we do sometimes some audits and we accompany the, the, the way of make some interviews or uh, in, interviewing some stakeholders but not doing a, a, a big evaluation on ongoing uh, uh, policies. So we make more evaluation three years after the end or after the beginning of the policy in order to have enough elements to make a good evaluation. Thank you very much. Thank you for this relevant question. Thank you to, for, to our colleagues in Spain and South Africa. I will now give the floor to my Swedish colleague Eva Lindström, who will, who will moderate the first panel today. No coffee break, sorry. So Eva Lindström, Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel, and I would also like to welcome everyone here today and also to those who follow us uh, on, on, online. So my name is Eva Lindström. I'm a member of the European Court of Auditors. I've been here since March last year. I'm now working in Chamber 5, and I'm very pleased to moderate this first round table. So according to the InterSci guidelines, which has just been presented, evaluation is becoming increasingly important for the public debate insofar as political leaders need to make decisions based on evidence. I think that is a quite uh, challenging uh, sentence, and I think definitely that Supreme Audit institutions, we, we are very natural actors uh, when it comes to public policies evaluations. Uh, but of course, I think it presents some challenges for us, both in terms of resource needs, but also what kind of methodology um, can we use. And I hope that we will come back to that specific question also during this uh, discussion. So the objective of this panel uh, discussion is to share practical examples uh, and also how the implementation on evaluation and on evaluation techniques have been carried out within our respective institutions. 
My background is that I have been uh, Auditor General in Sweden for seven years. I've also worked uh, in different um, um, agencies in Sweden with, with the evaluation, and I know from my own experience how important it is with both cooperation but also with uh, exchange of, of uh, b good practices between uh, Supreme Audit Institution. And I think if, when it comes to evaluation, when it comes to the use of different methodologies, I think this is really an area where we can learn a lot from each other. So, of course, I'm very delighted to have such a great uh, panel uh, and also to have a person from the United States. You've made your way uh, here uh, for us and uh, you're also countering a bit the very strong Swedish presence that we have ended up in this, in this round table. So, let me very shortly introduce the speakers. Steven Patansu, you are a senior social science uh, analyst at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. GAO, and also have an academic doing research and teaching at the un American University in Washington. So very happy to have you here. Erik Trollius, a uh, senior performance auditor from the National Audit Office in Sweden, and Sherzud uh, Jarmakamedov, senior auditor also from the Swedish uh, National Audit Office. And then we have uh, Charlotta Torneling, performance audit here at the ECA, Chamber One, and also Peter Welsh, who is director for Chamber One here at the ECA. So we will listen to uh, presentations, and I think after each and every presentation, we will have uh, the opportunity to, to ask a couple of questions. And then after the three presentations, I think we will have a more thorough uh, uh, opportunity to discuss between panelists and also ask questions uh, uh, when we have listened to all the three presentations. And also, since we're live on social media, we will also, of course, answer questions received from outside this room. So, now I will give the floor to our first speaker, Steven Patonso, who will develop, you have developed a great expertise on methodological issues regarding evaluation. So please, the floor is yours. All right, sorry about that, thank you. Um, again, my name is Stephen Patonsu. I'm with the US Government Accountability Office. I've been at the GAO for about 10 years, just over 10 years, um, and my background is in federal public policy and evaluation, so I've been doing this the whole time I've been there. Um, in fact, I you know, also teach evaluation at American University. Um, I've got students working on an assignment related to that right now, in fact. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit today about GAO's outline. Um, uh, good news for you all is that our French colleague uh, kind of covered a lot of what's in my first three or four slides, so I won't have to spend a whole lot of uh, time on that. Um, but basically what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk through um, how GAO defines evaluation. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we look at what federal agencies in the U.S. context are doing in terms of their agency-wide evaluation and their specific program evaluations. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about evaluations that are actually led by GAO that we do ourselves um, with, a, with an example at the end. Um, note that if the slides are available to you, I've linked everything that I talk about, um, but you can also find them on our website at gao.gov. Um, 
Starting off here with GAO's definition of evaluation, we think of it as a systematic study using research methods to collect and analyze data to assess how well a program is working and why. Um, this is in line with what um, our French colleague said with the um, definitions in that we are looking at kind of a variety of different methods that can be used to get at both how the program is working, what it is doing, and whether it is or is not achieving its goals. Um, we use this both for accountability purposes and for program um, improvement. Um, so again, when we think about accountability, we think about is the, a, is the federal program achieving the outcome it intends, and if not, what can we do to make sure it does and to hold folks accountable for that result? But the program improvement aspect is a lot more important to us oftentimes because if they're not achieving that impact or if they could be achieving a better impact, we might be able to offer some insights and thoughts about how to do that. And so evaluation gets us at kind of the underlying variables and causal mechanisms that might enable us to provide those kinds of recommendations. As with all SAIs, um, we tailor our studies to address the, kind of the customer questions that we receive, um, but we want to do that credibly and within available resources. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I do want to mention here that when we think about evaluation, we think it covers a range of work that we do, and, and I'll get to that, um, but that actually includes performance audits, so I'll get back to that question a little bit um, in the future. I want to lay out a couple um, of types of evaluations. These are the four that GAO has defined for us. Um, they do go back to the five types that were in the last presentation. So we think about process or implementation evaluations, outcome, impact, or cost-benefit evaluations. And in all of these cases, um, we're thinking about the research objectives underlying. So that fifth category is baked in to all, all four of these. The other thing I wanted to call to your attention here is a GAO document called Designing Evaluations, which is the closest thing we have to a standard for evaluation um, that GAO looks at when we're thinking about federal evaluations. We've gone through kind of the process of how you design, how you set your objectives, how you think about the methodologies that might be relevant. And so that document is often something that we use as a guideline um, as we're evaluating what agencies are doing. A couple of things just to clarify here, the process or implementation evaluations are ones for us that are focused on what's going on within an agency. This might be things like strategic, um, statutory, or regulatory compliance with specific aspects of how a program must be implemented. Um, you must have X number of employees, you must do that kind of thing. Um, but it's also often what we do when we're thinking about internal controls and management best practices, things that we use to kind of say, this is how a program should be operating, this is how it should work. We also look at both outcome and impact um, kind of evaluations. Outcome, of course, is that more traditional performance auditing, looking at performance metrics, ongoing monitoring, trying to see what is being produced by the agencies and whether that's being produced um, effectively, efficiently, and equitably. Um, we also think about impact evaluations, which goes that step further, which is not only what is the outcome being produced, but what is the net kind of social impact to the extent that we can work it out. We treat cost benefit and cost effective analysis as separate from these, but they're actually really built into most of them. We're often considering costs, um, both the resources needed to implement a program and kind of the efficiency of those programs in, in all forms of these. So GAO does a few different study types, um, and all of them we consider to be evaluation work in some extent or another. Um, we do performance audits, financial audits, and routine non-audits, which all might have evaluative components. We view kind of performance audit and evaluation as if you think of like a Venn diagram. They overlap in a lot of areas. Um, and so in the very, very traditional sense of a performance audit, you might see a hard kind of criteria of X number of widgets need to be created, um, and that's kind of a performance audit that doesn't have much evaluation context, um, doesn't have much evaluation in its scope. Um, but you might also see performance audits where we're looking at the combination of metrics, the underlying logic models, and the impact we expect them to achieve. And when we think of criteria, condition, cause, and effect, which is how we set up our recommendations at GAO, that cause and effect is really usually building in some kind of evaluation methodology or some kind of evaluation principle. So most of our performance audit work does include what we consider to be evaluation relevant methodology. Um, we use a range of different qualitative and quantitative methods to do this. Um, for example, we might use surveys, focus groups, expert panels, different ways of generating testimonial evidence, um, both from public, from the experts, from the agencies themselves. Um, we review a lot of documentary and physical evidence. We might do that very manually. We might do that through text analytic programs or through kind of structured systematic content analyses. Um, and we often use either primary or 
or oftentimes more often secondary data to do descriptive and statistical analysis that might allow us to get at some of those kind of underlying correlation relationships that could be tied to cause. Um, our primary uh, use of evaluation or consider of evaluation in the technical impact kind of way that we often think of program evaluation is looking at agency systems and agency programs. At the system level, we evaluate things like the agency's capacity and the resources that they have for evaluation. We also look at their plans, their agendas, their kind of goals for doing evaluation or gathering evidence. Um, and I'm going to sidestep in a second and talk about evidence instead of evaluation at the end of this slide. We also think about their processes and their implementation and the use of that evaluation. So for example, this last product here um, is a survey of federal managers across the US federal government that asks them not only whether they have evaluations available to them, um, but how they use it and the kinds of things that they use it for. Um, because when we're assessing evaluation, we want to make sure that the information being generated is not only a good evaluation, uh, but that it generates useful information for decision makers and that it actually is used by decision makers. Recently, um, earlier this year, in fact, a new law was passed called the uh, Future of Evidence-Based Policymaking Act in the United States, and it addresses all three of these areas. And so we're, we're kind of excited about this. It's got some built-in mandates for us to evaluate um, you know, the federal impl implementation of this. But on the point of capacity and resources, this law actually now requires major federal agencies to hire chief evaluation officers and chief data officers. So they're putting somebody in charge who's going to be accountable for thinking about evidence and accountability throughout the agency, um, which we think is a good step. Um, it requires them to review the evidence that they have and with evidence that should include performance information, evaluation information, ongoing monitoring, basically anything that they have at their disposal and identify gaps in that information and generate learning plans to try and achieve new evidence to get that information and that could be through new evaluations, that could be through modifications to the performance system. Um, and finally on the process um, performance and use, we think that this really sets up an environment where with somebody accountable for the information with uh, transparently published plans for gathering this kind of information and doing these kinds of evaluations that we've set up kind of a system where we can get better and more deeper into these evaluations and getting agencies to use them um, so we can assess those goals transparently. Um, I'm going to personally say that I really think this opens up a lot um, in terms of the federal government for breaking down some of the silos of information and evidence that exist. We often think about performance audits as being separate from evaluation or we think about ongoing monitoring as being separate. But this provides a framework where you could say, you know, we use evaluation to set up the logic model that we think, that we think builds on the monitoring metrics that we want to track. Then we track those methods. We do a uh, post, uh, ex post evaluation to see if it was working. And maybe we find that that logic model needs to be changed. Maybe we can feed it back in. Maybe the evaluations can share some of that performance data. So all of those kind of avenues are opening up. And we think that that's, that's a good um, advancement that's going to happen. And we're excited to get to start working on implementation and assessing the implementation of that. We also look at specific agency program evaluations. I've got a lot of examples on this slide, but they range from the very basic, hey, we're going to look at the research questions that are being specified in this job on uh, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. We looked at studies that were being done in, in various African countries that were receiving funding. And we took a look at kind of the questions that were being asked. And, and a lot of times, we had maybe corruption questions. Um, we had maybe delivery questions or supply chain questions. And we assessed you know, what parts of this are not being Covered. What parts of the system do we not see evidence on um, that might also uh, need to have some research dedicated to them? We also assess whether the design and methodology of, of their evaluations, of federal agency evaluations, meet good standards. Um, often those standards are in designing evaluation or they might be technical standards of statistics, things like that. Um, the foreign assistance job here, uh, we looked at over 100 foreign assistance evaluations and we judged them on everything from whether their methodology you know, uh, actually supported their conclusions or actually answered their researchable questions. Sometimes we found they did, sometimes we found they didn't. We were able to kind of make some recommendations about processes you could put into and considerations you can put into evaluation to make sure that they're more consistently delivering on those promises. We often look at reliable data or the accuracy of analysis of programs. This Medicaid demonstration program we looked at um, basically was a program that sets up a counterfactual. We have a demonstration program and then we have what would have existed if uh, the 
um, original policy stayed in place. In this particular example, what they did was instead of looking at the original policy, they made a counterfactual counterfactual of another new policy which was never implemented in which they had no data on um, they had no way of actually making the kind of forecast to do this comparison so we came back and we said you can't evaluate this way um, where you're basically making up the program and assuming it would be implemented there's no way you could have identified what what impacts and unintended consequences might have happened we also look at kind of whether the findings we're looking at are contextually sophisticated, whether they're rooted in things that are actionable for decision makers. So again, here we've got you know strategies to facilitate agencies' use of evaluation gets at some of the things that federal agencies can do to make sure that they're not just looking at a number or presenting a big quantitative analysis that's going to be hard to digest, but they're presenting something that's rooted in sometimes qualitative information or sometimes meaningful policy um, relationships to make sure that decision makers find it valuable. Now I'm going to turn to GAO-led evaluation efforts. What I would say is that most of the time, GAO's bread and butter is performance audits. I think they make up something like 90% of the things that we do, um, of the reports that we issue. Um, we tend to get those through congressional requests, though about 5% are done through the Comptroller General's authority. Um, some of those come through uh, not only requests, but mandates embedded in the law. Um, and when we get those questions, we start off a research design and methodology process where we work together with the stakeholder incorporation, um, as described by my uh, French colleague uh, where we figure out well is this a good question how does this question need to be modified in order to make sure that it's unbiased to make sure that it's neutral and fact-based um, and we think about the different methodologies that are available the extent to which evaluation might be a part of that methodology and we think about the resources that would be um, required to answer those questions kind of sufficiently and appropriately and I'm going to talk about what sufficiently and appropriately means in that context in a minute. Um, but for us, that's kind of the idea of when do we satisfy our client? When might we be doing a disservice to our client by providing an incomplete answer? And when do we need to make sure that, that we're kind of balancing that appropriately? In that discussion, we think about the types of findings, conclusions, and recommendations that we might be able to make. Uh, we like to be able to make recommendations, right? Um, because that's how we know we're helping with the program improvement process. We're helping to identify ways that government can do better and be more effective, efficient, and equitable. Um, these lead to different financial and non-financial accomplishments. Um, Typically now, when we do this work, it's centered around kind of legal and regulatory compliance. It's uh, centered around research stu stewardship, so efficiency, economy. Um, we think a lot about the goal setting processes, the planning processes, implementation processes, and internal controls. Um, and then on the impact side of things, we're typically looking at measuring, monitoring, and evaluations being done by the agencies. Um, we rarely do our own impact evaluations um, that are standalone uh, by themselves. Um, but when we do, they're typically intended for prospective decision making. We're really thinking about what are the range of variables that might influence a given outcome and how can you think about how those different variables can be targeted. Um, they tend to utilize a variety of approaches. Um, the one I'm going to present today uses a quasi-experimental design, but we also use varieties of different multivariate analysis and statistical modeling. We do some simulation like Monte Carlo and things like that um, to kind of think about the future, think about potential impacts think about uncertainty and build those into our to our evaluations the staff and financial resources needs vary here so when we're doing our own version of the evaluability assessment we're thinking about okay by estimating some kind of an impact of this program if we're going to take that extra step what does that bias in terms of the strength of our recommendations does that make our recommendation more compelling does that make the information more useful does that better show the value that the program is generating and if we can't answer yes to some or all of those questions we might consider kind of scaling back the evaluation portion of the audit and focusing more on kind of the traditional uh, performance audit um, criteria um, these products when they're standalone are less likely to have recommendations and accomplishments, but like I said, we most of the time are building in evaluation into performance audits. So you might see the evaluation results kind of influencing what that recommendation and the performance audit side looks like, and that's what I'm gonna show you an example of now. Um, this is a report from May 2014 where we looked at um, broadband, so internet loans being provided to rural communities across the United States. Um, and we were looking at basically the performance and the economic impact of these loans. Um, our researchable question here was, does federal support for broadband access increase economic performance? Um, 
there were some challenges related to this. First of all, as you all are familiar with, with evaluation, there are a lot of different factors that may influence this outcome, right? Economic development is happening in and around communities all the time. We are giving them a treatment of this loan, and we want to separate out the impact of this treatment. So we had to think about what were the other variables that might be influencing economic development that we could think about, maybe find data on, maybe control for so that we could get a better estimate. We also had some limitations related to kind of the geographic boundaries of, of the affected areas. Um, specifically, you know, counties don't necessarily correspond to juris political jurisdictions. And also our kind of program impact here is focused on rural communities. And in a given county, there might be several rural communities. Um, there might be a small city and a rural community. There might be a big city and a rural community because counties are of various different sizes across the US. So we had to do a lot to kind of control for the type of county. Um, we also had to think about the county characteristics um, and the rural characteristics. So the prevailing assumption when we use the word rural across the federal government is n generally a poorer area that's in need of assistance, um, a greater need of assistance than some other areas. So when we're thinking about equity, but there are also rural areas that are quite affluent. Um, and so we had to think about that and think about um, whether or not we could scope those out appropriately. Um, the last thing here is that broadband access, um, which is what we had data on, the number of loans that were given to improve access and the number of providers that were available in a given community, is not the same as use. We didn't have direct data on how much citizens were actually taking advantage of these broadband services. So I'll talk a little bit about how we mitigated that, that limitation as we go forward. This um, uh, figure here shows the number of US counties that had one or more approved loans to establish a new broadband service between 2002 and 2013. Uh, you can see from this image that they're broadly geographically distributed. They cut across most of the US states. Um, some of these are larger counties. Some of these are smaller counties. Um, there are about 100 completed loans during this period, um, the 2002 to 2013 period across these counties. So we developed a quasi-experimental design where we wanted to compare these counties that received the loans with three different kind of similar types of counties. Um, we did this three different kinds of matched counties for a number of reasons. They controlled for different aspects of those limitations that we were considering. So we thought about counties that had projects that applied for a loan and were rejected. These are, in theory, counties that maybe had some of the same needs for broadband access, maybe some of the same qualifications in terms of the overall kind of poverty level, income level, economic development, um, but maybe just missed the bar for, for being eligible. Um, we also looked at counties that were similar based on observable characteristics. I'll get into how we did that in a second. Um, but basically, we looked at counties that had similar size, similar demographics, similar socioeconomic status, things like that. Um, and we also looked at counties that were geographically adjacent because there are some kind of larger regional or statewide or other geographical um, determined impacts that we thought would be relevant to economic development. Um, so for example, there might not be a whole lot of business in my county, but one county that's a 10 minute drive over might be getting a lot of development and there, there can be some spillover effects or there can be some lack of need for that because you can just drive to the other county if it's close enough. Um, so we wanted to compare those, those kinds of counties as well. We compared them on three kind of outcome measures that we were interested in. The first outcome measure was the employment rate within the county. We wanted to see whether increased access to broadband could actually increase the employment outcomes of the community with the idea that by having broadband in, you might be able to lower some of the costs of employment and therefore increase the number of people being hired. Uh, we also looked at the total amount of payroll that was going out. So not only the number of people who were employed, um, but the aggregate kind of amount of salary that was being paid to them across those things. Um, and we also looked at the number of bu business establishments in a county. So were new businesses coming up um, that, that as a result of this increased access to broadband. Um, a little bit about our data and the analysis that we used. Um, the first piece of data that we used was the USDA file on the loans themselves. Um, it provided us kind of the number of loans, the details of the applications we were able to look in and see the qualifications of the underlying communities. We were able to see kind of the number of broadband um, uh, providers that were in the county before and after the loan. Um, and then the second set of, set of data we used was from the census, the US Census, um, which had some county business patterns, annual performance information. And this gets to kind of the point where the SAIs are kind of a natural 
place for evaluation to happen um, because the USDA doesn't necessarily have access to or knowledge of this census data. This is something that we brought to the table from our previous knowledge of other audit work we've done. We were able to combine the two data sets to do something kind of a little bit novel and a little bit interesting. Uh, our methods here, um, first we did proximity scoring regressions to select the control groups. This is what I was talking about in terms of the demographic matching. Uh, we basically developed logistic regressions that modeled the probability um, that a county was qualified or eligible for a loan and so when we had one that received a loan we were able to then match it to another county that was similar um, in its probability to receive a loan but maybe did not receive it um, we then created a panel set of nine annual observations for each county um, those of you who are paying attention might see 2002 to 2013 and then ask why only nine years um, it's because the census data we have was only available up through 2011 um, it hadn't been updated yet it, there's kind of a lag in, in making that data available. Um, so we uh, weren't able to do the full 11 years. We were able to create nine annual observations. Once we had those observations, we used a fixed effects regression that count, uh, controlled in each period for the county and for the year that we were looking at um, with a binary indicator where the year after you got a loan, that indicator switched over to a one and it remained a one for the rest of the year so that we could run the regression that way. What we found was that the areas that got at least one of these loans um, were associated with higher levels of employment and payroll. Um, the employment tended to go up about 1%. The payroll had, uh, tended to go up about 4%, um, controlling for all the other factors here. Um, and that happened both in the year after and for the subsequent years that we were able to look at. Um, they were robust across all three of those different county comparisons that I, that I told you about. And so we were consistently finding that. Oh, sorry. A couple limitations of this. Number one, um, we weren't able to look at the sub-county level. The data were only available at the county, and we think that might be obscuring some of the effects. Again, some part of the county might be the one that's really in need of the loan um, or really in need of the service, and if that represents a small fraction of the community, um, that 1% to 4% happening only over here in this small area might be hiding that the actual impact for that small group was, was higher. Um, we also, you know, again, did not think about use here, so we don't know the extent to which if there were some kind of compelling case to increase the use, whether these impacts might change. Um, and these are sh relatively short-term effects. They're, they're over a few years. Um, Long-term, we'd like to look at things like um, whether this better access to broadband maybe helps school children, right? Improves education, improves the, economic, uh, the, the economy in the long run, those, those kinds of issues. That's it for this example. To conclude, I just want to talk for a second about um, GAO's Center for Evaluation and Methods Issues. Um, I'm from a team within GAO called Applied Research and Methods, and one of our subgroups in that team is called the Center for Evaluation and Methods Issues. We work across the building to kind of get evaluation methods into all of the different performance audit and performance evaluation products that we do, um, and we lead guidance uh, work to develop guidance and good practices like that designing evaluations that I talked to you about um, earlier in thinking about executing performance audit. Audits. Um, one, in, one cool thing that the Center for Evaluation Methods Issues has is this uh, Fed Eval Listserv, which is a c community of about 1,500 federal evaluation experts and practitioners. They're mostly US based, but there are a few kind of all around the globe. Um, and so I provided a link to that there. Um, what I can say now, what's interesting about the Center for Evaluation and Methods Issues is it's the only team within the Applied Research and Methods team that's directly led um, by our managing director, Nancy Kingsbury. Um, and, and she has a very keen kind of interest in developing our evaluation capacity and developing guidance for federal evaluation as a whole. Um, so she takes a very kind of direct lead in on this. And um, if you want to contact us about the center, about any of our work, you can obviously reach out to me. My, my contact information is on the first slide, but you can also um, reach out to Nancy or I can put you in touch with her. Um, and that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Stephen, for this very interesting presentation. And I guess there are a lot of questions coming up. So please feel free. Who would like to start? Yep. Thank you for the presentation. It is really impressive to see the range of different social science methodologies that you use in the audit. And um, my question relates to this question in the assumptions of this uh, of this method. And uh, you mentioned a couple 
such as simulations, for example, that really require um, discretional decisions about the assumptions. And we know that, especially if we think really, really long term, then these assumptions may really impact the the final results, and they may turn the the results quite the other way around. With this, this is absolutely normal in the academic world, but I'm wondering if how you deal with that being auditors. Um, and I can just share from from our experience, uh, we fa we had an audit um, recently. Uh, where we actually did something opposite in the sense that we were looking at one agency that runs some simulations in the financial sector. And then remember, we had really endless discussions about one single assumption in the simulations that they run. And we we knew that this single assumption, even if it, if it rests within a reasonable range, um, the decision where these, the decision about the specific assumption, it would really impact the, the 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 final results of that. So I really remember very technical, very long discussions with this agency on whether this specific assumption was reasonable or not. And the same would obviously apply if we did the simulations. Then the the audited entity could uh, could enter with us into very lengthy and technical discussions. Uh, regarding these assumptions, so I was wondering how you deal with uh, about it and how you how you set your assumptions and how much discretion you allow yourself in these in these methods. Thank you. Thank you. That that's a very good question, and I think that I, I have two examples that might help uh, think about how we do this. Um, the first thing I want to say is GAO in terms of methodology. We're a methodologically conservative organization. Uh, we want to minimize uncertainty as much as we can. We want to make kind of conservative estimates that aren't uh, going to make things look much bigger than they are or much smaller than they are. So we try our best to, to limit our assumptions to those that, that are reasonable, as you mentioned, um, but also that if we have ones where we know there's a big um, potential for uncertainty or a big potential for impact, we try to present the range or the confidence interval or whatever kind of estimation um, that we can think of. Um, so one example of this is a model that we looked at interfreight transportation across the US, so basically comparisons of trucks and trains carrying cargo across, across the country, um, and looked at things like the cost and the environmental impact of that. And it turns out the Department of Transportation had a very kind of detailed, elaborate model um, for estimating the impact that each one of these kind of modes of transportation would have. It had something like 35 variables in it. Um, and we went and we wanted to look at that model and see the data underlying it and understand their estimation better. And as we dug into it, what we realized was that um, of those 35 variables, something like 26 of them were set at a single point estimate value that had it wasn't data, it wasn't a, an input into a model, but it was a hard-coded assumption. Um, and when we looked at kind of all of those variables and we considered what those assumptions stood for, we went and found other data sources that kind of got us to, well, what do we think the mean or the and the underlying probability distribution of these assumptions are? And then we ran a Monte Carlo simulation that allowed each of them to vary across that kind of distribution. Um, and what we found was that when you do that, when you uh, allow those assumptions to vary, um, you get very, very imprecise and very kind of hard to interpret um, non-committal results. And we said, so, you know, this model, it's great that you have this model and we really like this model, um, but we think it would be improved if you started using some of the data that was available instead of hard coding these assumptions so that you can generate some of those kind of uncertainty, uncertainty estimates. And in, I won't do the second estimate since I'm conscious of time. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. A very important and, and uh, interesting question. Any more comments or questions? Yes. yes. Daniel. I have a question that's, uh, about the, the Center for Evaluation and Methods issues. Could you develop a little bit about the organization changed over time, how it works, how many people, what kind of staff, etc.? Sorry, every time. Um, so the Center for Valuation Methods Issues was created when ARM was created, which was back um, before my time at GAO. I don't want to guess a year. Um, but a, uh, the kind of logic of how the Applied Research and Methods team was uh, founded was originally we had a bunch of subject area teams across GAO, and each of them might have some technical specialists, some data analysts or methodologists um, that were really embedded within those teams. Um, and over time, we developed kind of two understandings of that system. 
One was that those methodologists and technical specialists um, weren't completely separate from their management chains. They weren't operating independently of, of the kind of analysts who were doing the work. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we strengthened their independence a little bit. Um, we also found out that there was a lot of knowledge across the organization that was in one person only. Um, and so the decision to create an applied research and methods team where all of the specialists were co-located solved both of those problems. So now we operate a little bit independently um, of, the, of the analysts on the engagement so that we can provide technical support and methodology and have some oversight of methodology. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity to come together as a community and kind of we do regular kind of training with each other so that we can build these skills. That's how um, ARM was formed, and the Center for Evaluation and Methods Issues was there at that time. Um, I don't recall exactly how big the staff was. I think it might have been six to 10 people um, who were dedicated full time to it. Um, we've recently had a couple of those folks, like Stephanie Shipman, who's a big expert in evaluation, retire. Um, so we're down to, I think, four now. Um, but what has happened over time is that folks from the other centers within ARM, such as myself, I'm in a different center altogether, have come in and we do that evaluation work kind of part time, or we do it kind of um, in addition to um, those staff. Um, so the capacity is roughly the same, I would say, um, but we are now kind of making a dedicated effort to rebuild that team and to strengthen that team given these new mandates that have come through. Thank you very much. I think we will come back to the question on, on how to develop competence and skills and also, as you mentioned, take use of, of the competences that you have in the organizations. We have two questions. First one from Denmark. Uh, you mentioned outcome and impact evaluations, for which in fact go beyond the more classic performance audits. How are your stakeholders using this information? What is the added value compared to a classic performance audit uh, report? And also, are you using only internal resources to do this work or also external experts? And do you have a budget to perform evaluations? <laughs> so, three different questions. Um, so the first question, la I'll answer the last question first. GAO's appropriation is a single appropriation that's not divided by program area. Um, so we have a little bit of flexibility. Uh, we, the Comptroller General has a little flexibility about exactly how that gets applied across the organization. There's not, to my knowledge, a specific bucket for evaluation. Um, but like I said, we have a team that's dedicated to it, so, so we dedicate quite, quite a few resources to it. Um, the other question about the impact um, and outcome evaluations, we think that our stakeholders are using these um, to make good improvements. We think that the, often our strongest performance audits are the ones that are looking at outcomes and impacts um, and the ones that are really tying program activities to what are, what's the value the taxpayer is getting in terms of effectiveness, efficiency, and equity. Um, one of the kind of clear um, categories that I think is often missing between what we call a performance audit and what was defined as an evaluation in the earlier presentation is this consideration of the coherence um, which came up. Um, and in one area of our work, I think we've done a really good job of starting to build into that. We do a body of work called fragmentation, <coughs> overlap, and duplication, where we're looking at um, government programs across the federal government um, to the extent that they're similar to each other, they provide similar services, support similar beneficiaries. And in that body of work, we're really looking at how do those programs fit together? Um, and kind of an interesting SAI thing, uh, we initially got a mandate for this that said, identify anywhere where there's duplication and tell us how to get rid of it. And we came back and we said, well, sometimes you want to get rid of it. Sometimes you actually might want to strengthen it. You know, we all back up our data, we all have redundant systems and kind of military systems that we want to make sure are survivable. Um, and so we think about duplication in a little bit more of a nuanced way and we think about, well, how can these programs maybe coordinate or plan together um, or develop performance metrics together that can ensure that their unique experiences and expertises are contributing to the overall goal as opposed to thinking of them as kind of uh, interchangeable, completely different parts. And so those are all performance audits, but they really are getting more to that issue of coherence and they're getting much heavier on kind of overall cost and benefit evaluation that I think leads to better decisions about well we don't necessarily eliminate all of them sometimes we improve the coordinating mechanisms or sometimes we make some other decisions based on what's best for the outcome we're intending okay uh, and then we have a question from France 
uh, to the panel, but Stephen, feel free to start. What is for you the added value of an evaluation performed by external auditors compared to evaluations made under the responsibility or contracted by an administration? And I think you touched upon that when you talked about the sort of the building of the ecosystem that you have with the agencies. But please elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, so, so again, I think the, the first advantage is that as uh, an entity that looks across the government, we do have a lot of pockets of knowledge and specialty that allow us to draw connections that folks within the agencies might not be aware of or might not see. Um, we do a lot of work on performance management, and one part of our performance management system in the U.S. is the law requires the establishment of some high-priority cross-agency priority goals, is what they're called, um, where agencies are supposed to kind of identify um, what other agencies are out there doing the same work. And early on, what we found was that agencies had a lot of difficulty finding the other agencies that were doing the same stuff, and a lot of GAO's work that was drawing on this fragmentation overlap duplication body of work or on other work where we're looking at uh, goals, we were able to identify where programs had similar goals and start kind of uh, identifying those stakeholders for our audits. Um, and when we maybe did like a focus group interview with them or a round table with them, they started to get to know each other too. Um, so OPM, I want to give them due credit, does, does the bulk of that kind of coordination work. Um, but I think that having GAO involved also supplemented it a bit and also kind of helped uh, develop their own awareness of, of how they're all working together. Okay, anyone else who wants to comment on that question? Please. Maybe one comment. So I think both are very important uh, evaluation done by the audit office or evaluation done by the agency. And we can see in Switzerland that when we do an evaluation at the Swiss audit office, we have more interest in the media and in the parliament because our projects are more independent than with, when the evaluation are done by the agencies. When the agencies are doing their, themselves the evaluations, they go. They have a better access to the bet, better questions and better uh, data. Then we have a good access. But to to ask the good questions, we are less bad. We are less good situated than an agency. Agencies they should make regularly evaluation about different topics. So we are more complementary. I think 80% of the evaluation should be done by the agencies and 20% from the audit office. Okay, before I leave the floor to our Swedish colleagues, I would just like to ask a question also, and that is coming back to, to what we started the, 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 this um, panel about what is the difference between performance audit and in evaluation, and I, I fully agree that it has something to do with scope, uh, but I think also uh, when it comes to sort of the role of audit, as you said, it's both for accountability, but it also for, for improving programs. Stephen, could you please just say a few words on on the question of the sort of the time schedule because looking at impact for me uh, uh, I think it's it's reasonable to to assume that it all most things take time and it's not possible to to evaluate the impact uh, you, you need several years maybe five years maybe ten years sometimes uh, and and uh, using these kind of, of uh, um, investigations or, or evaluation for accountability when when people who were responsible for the beginning is no longer they are no longer in office so how do you see the question of, of timing um, in evaluation compared to more sort of strict audit uh, thank you for that question I th think that when we're talking about the more strict audits we're often looking at programs that have ex existed for a while. Um, at GAO, we do a little bit of ex-ante evaluations where we're looking at programs before they stand up, like the current reorganization of the federal government. We're kind of testifying on that and working on that. 
um, to make sure that we're thinking things through and planning and setting goals uh, before we take action to, to undergo such a massive change. Um, but most of the time we're working on ongoing programs or even sometimes programs that are already over. Um, and what I would say is that in, in that traditional sense, uh, we often, again, we can build them in together because there have been a few years, there has been some, some outstanding kind of e example of things happening. Um, that said, I think in the evaluation and really looking at impacts, um, you're absolutely right that it, it often takes longer um, or it often takes kind of measurements that pursue after the end of whatever implementation has happened. And so you might have a performance monitoring metric that appears in year 2000. 2011, but the real impact from that doesn't happen until 2016, 2020, um, right? Um, one thing that the U.S. government's doing that's kind of trying to get at this a bit um, is building evidence into some of the authorizations for the programs. So, for example, we now have something called tiered evidence grants, which are provided um, largely to development, education, kind of other social programs, where in order to create a new education program, you first have to start um, with kind of an ex-ante evaluation and a setup of the kinds of evaluation you would do um, to look at the results that you're interested in. And that's kind of tier one. That's the, that's the starting level. Um, you cannot move on to the next tier unless you've actually proven a demonstrated result on those metrics that you've done through an evaluation. Um, and so then you can get the tier two, which allows you to then expand to other kind of locations or other, other um, built-in areas. Um, and so by building in that evidence to go throughout, we can start to get highlights of some preliminary impacts at least, or some preliminary logic models in the early years, and we continue to build both monitoring and evaluation throughout the course of a program's life. Okay, uh, thank you, and thank you again for an excellent presentation. So, uh, now I would like to introduce Eric Trollius and Shersud Jarmak Hatmedo. Did I get that right? Thank you. Uh, you will share your experience of evaluation as auditors of the Swedish National Audit Office. So, please.
Yeah. Uh, I will start out by uh, talking about our mandate, our resources, and uh, a bit uh, about our methodology. And then my colleague Sjersog will uh, tell you about an example of a recently uh, carried out performance audit. The Swedish National Audit Office uh, is an independent authority under uh, the control of the parliament. There is a mandate to audit the whole chain of executive power. Focus is on circumstances related to the central government budget, the implementation and results of state activities, uh, and how the state receives an effective return on its investments. State agencies are required to provide uh, the National Audit Office with the information needed for the audit. And as part of the per performance audit, uh, recommendations are given for alternative measures to achieve the intended results. We publish around 35 performance audit reports every year. When finished, the reports are submitted to the parliament, which in turn submits them to the government for statements. The government will address the conclusions and recommendations of the report in a statement, and uh, then the relevant parliamentary committee considers the document and Parliament makes a decision on the matter. The average time used for a performance audit is uh, 2,500 hours. It's about one year from start to finish. Uh, but uh, there's quite a bit of uh, variation in that number. Uh, about 100 employees are working with performance auditing, divided into six units, uh, depending on audit areas. Uh, it's not uncommon that we swap between these uh, units and use our skills on uh, different fields. Uh, most of us are economists and political scientists, but there are also some business economists, some sociologists, uh, statisticians, and uh, people with other backgrounds. The teams working on an audit are small, uh, consisting of usually two, sometimes three members, uh, of which one is the team leader. Uh, then we have uh, internal and external specialists uh, who are used in the quality assurance process. Uh, the external specialists are often scholars who are experts on uh, either the methods used or on the general topic of the audit. Uh, but it's very important that uh, they are not uh, allowed to influence the results of the audit. This picture shows how the planning phase and uh, designing of the audit will guide the rest of the process. Uh, in the planning phase, we, we explore if and how to approach the chosen topic uh, so in this phase, we should clarify the audit problem, uh, the audit objective, uh, questions, and criteria. Uh, so we start out by asking, is this issue within our mandate? Uh, what kind of performance problem might exist? Uh, is there a potential for a change to the positive? Uh, 
then we ask why is this important to audit what can our contribution here be uh, and when it comes to the audit criteria uh, if possible uh, they are based on the decisions and statements of the parliament uh, but they need to be uh, broken down and uh, operationalized by us uh, in order to be useful uh, the audit criteria should be designed so that the findings can be related back to the questions and the conclusions be related back to the objective. Uh, finally, the performance audit gives recommendations which should be pointing at the body that can actually do something about the problem. The main focus of our performance audits uh, is uh, the so-called 3E, uh, economy, efficiency, effectiveness. Uh, effectiveness is uh, the most common aim of the audits, although uh, the other two are also present in a fair amount of, uh, of audits. Um, results can of course be measured on different levels, for example output, outcomes, impacts uh, and so on. Uh, some audits are less uh, result oriented and they instead focus more on the internal conditions and processes of the audited organization. Uh, so a, a variety of methods are used here and uh, uh, we often need to combine them in order to meet the audit's objective. Uh, as a general rule, uh, we often want to not only show what the result is, but we also want to analyze how it came to be and how it might be improved. Uh, advanced methods uh, with a more ambitious data collection and analysis uh, can be used to increase the value of the audits. Uh, in some areas we have a longer tradition of these kinds of evaluations. Uh, for example, when it comes to labor market programs and some other areas. Uh, but there has been a conscious effort uh, the last few years to increase uh, the portion of these kind of audits uh, by recruiting new personnel with the right skill set and so on. Uh, but one issue that uh, is uh, very important is that these new uh, skill sets and uh, these new methods uh, the guidelines and, per and the purpose of performance auditing. Uh, it's not enough to just produce interesting uh, evaluations. Uh, it has to tie in in a good way with our actual mission. Uh, so now I will uh, leave to Sjörsold to talk about uh, an example. Thank you, Eric. Uh, my name is Sherzat Jarmohamedov. Uh, I'm a senior performance auditor at the Swedish National Audit Office. And uh, we would like to talk about the project which uh, we have done uh, in this year, which is going to be published in September. Uh, so uh, this is an evaluation of the procurement process in uh, road maintenance where we especially focused uh, uh, on the discrepancy between the initial and final costs uh, in the contract. And this project uh, has been done uh, uh, by Eric and me. Uh, if we will start, so uh, the periodic and the road time road maintenance costs uh, were about 1 billion euros in 2017 
and the focus of this project uh, was on the routine uh, road maintenance, which had a cost about 0 0.3 billion euros. And uh, to increase the uh, cost efficiency of uh, road maintenance, a competitive tendering is uh, introduced uh, so that uh, all maintenance work is put out on the tender and uh, contracted out to the uh, winning company. And uh, our criteria after uh, pre-qualification criteria is met is uh, uh, the lowest price uh, get the contract. So before we started this um, audit, uh, there were indications of cost overruns uh, in this uh, road maintenance contract. Uh, I mean, uh, the final costs uh, for road maintenance contracts often exceeded the initial costs uh, stipulated in the contract. So. The objective of this uh, project was uh, to analyze uh, the cost deviations in the road maintenance contracts. Uh, more specifically, uh, we looked uh, at uh, three questions. Uh, are cost deviations comprehensive? Uh, are there systematic factors that impact cost deviations? Uh, and has a road authority undertaken effective measures to minimize cost deviations? And this, the third question has been uh, divided into three sub-questions. Uh, does a road authority follow up works performed uh, during the contract period? Does a road authority possess sufficient knowledge about road condition and needs in preparing the tender request documentation? And the last one is, are maintenance contracts designed to facilitate uh, the socioeconomic efficiency? Uh, when it comes to methods, so question number one is answered with uh, descriptive analysis of tender contract data. Uh, question number two is answered with the regression methods using tender contract data to determine the systematic factors that impact cost deviations. And uh, question number three, with its sub-questions, is answered with analysis of decisions, steering documents, reports, and interviews uh, with uh, representatives from the robot authority. Uh, maintenance contract costs consists of two parts, winter service costs and uh, other maintenance work, and uh, the cost for winter services uh, are difficult to predict due to the stochastic nature of the weather. Uh, therefore, these cost categories uh, were treated uh, separately. Um, so we estimate a cost deviation model uh, per cost category for maintenance area I and contract period T. So basically we uh, we model cost deviation as a function of several uh, parameters like uh, contract specific uh, characteristics, uh, winning bidder, competitiveness level, contract period, uh, uh, same project manager, etc. And uh, we have also controlled for maintenance area specific characteristics like road lens, vehicle kilometers, uh, location, and other parameters. And uh, we also controlled for uh, weather conditions, uh, such uh, as the number of days with slippery road and snowfall and uh, procurement year uh, indicators as well. As it's uh, panel data we are dealing with, uh, we also controlled for unobserved maintenance area heterogeneity there. So I will not uh, focus so much in details in econometric parts of this project. Uh, therefore, I should just mention that the model specification tests which we have conducted within this project indicate that the uh, cost deviation model for other maintenance uh, cost category has been estimated with random effects model and the winter service part was estimated with uh, hybrid model. Uh, data. Uh, uh, we used the Swedish road maintenance data on 47 maintenance contracts uh, that are finished 
2017 and uh, 2018. It's uh, half of the contracts which uh, uh, was available, but uh, usable was only 47 contracts. Uh, and these contracts are procured 2011, 12, 13, and 14. And uh, contract lens uh, is from uh, four to seven years, and um, options were from one to three years. And uh, each contract is absorbed annually, periodically, uh, and the contract uh, period is 12 months, uh, from uh, September to the August uh, the following year. And the uh, road maintenance market is dominated by four big uh, entrepreneurs in Sweden. Uh, they cover 97% uh, of the whole road maintenance market. And uh, the period of observation uh, is from 2011 to 2018, and the number of observations uh, is 259. So if we go to the results, uh, descriptive analysis uh, uh, shows that in the figure one, as you may see, uh, the distribution of cost deviations in terms of the entire contract. So. 45 out of 47 studied contracts have finished with cost deviations uh, larger than uh, zero. And uh, cost deviations uh, have a quite, ri uh, quite wide range. Uh, it's from zero to 200%, and uh, with mean cost deviation being 41%, and median cost deviation being 31%. Uh, if we will... Um, look separately into cost categories, uh, then we may see that uh, uh, other maintenance costs category has a higher um, mean cost deviation being 57% uh, and uh, um, for winter service cost category being 33% on average cost deviation. So I should mention that uh, a road authority had uh, different uh, presumptions about this, so they had some anecdotal evidence that uh, all cost deviations were tied to the winter uh, costs because uh, winter costs are unpredictable. Uh, but uh, the data shows that it's other way around. And uh, the results from the regression analysis is, <clears throat> uh, if we look at the cost category, other maintenance. So we have identified some uh, systematic factors that reduce cost deviations, and we identified some factors that increase cost deviations. And uh, those factors, which you see on the slide, these are statistically significant results. And uh, just to mention a few, uh, for instance, um, uh, B entrepreneurs B and C have lower cost deviations compared to entrepreneur A, if we will uh, want to have some interpretation of the results. And uh, another example is uh, being a project leader from the beginning to the end of the contract leads to uh, lower cost deviations, which means that uh, continuity in project management uh, benefits uh, road authority. So they sh should uh, uh, consider this uh, uh, possibility to have uh, as much as possible uh, continuity in project management. So, and uh, some uh, other factors uh, uh, which lead to the uh, increase in cost deviations. For example, we have controlled for different procurement years uh, in these contracts. Uh, and in uh, 2000, all the contracts which has been procured in 2013 had uh, higher cost deviations compared to the contracts uh, procured in uh, 2011. So there might be some uh, process uh, improvements or alterations in the 
procurement process which has resulted in this uh, finding. So it's a message to the robot authority to reconsider probably uh, their uh, reform which has been done within the procurement process. If we will uh, look at the another cost category, winter services, so we have found some results as well, uh, which lead to cost, uh, which lead to the reduction in cost deviations or increase in cost deviations. And uh, uh, if we will mention some uh, of them, uh, for instance, uh, entrepreneur D has lower cost deviation compared to entrepreneur A. So, and uh, being the same entrepreneur, so we have uh, looked, we have um, made some uh, uh, interaction terms in the model uh, to see how uh, an entrepreneur, if entrepreneur becomes responsible for the same area, how their uh, impact will be on cost deviations. And we see that uh, two of them have uh, lower uh, cost deviations uh, if they will take over the same maintenance area compared to the contract where they have been only once responsible entrepreneurs. So <clears throat> we have made as well uh, additional, uh, more thorough analysis of three contracts with the largest cost deviations. And we have found that um, the ranking of bids according to the tender award criteria, the lowest price doesn't always hold after changes uh, in the contract during the contract period in two cases. Uh, I mean, uh, the second best bid would have been a better choice uh, for the road authority after taking into account uh, the actual work order during the contract period. And uh, another finding uh, was that risk sharing proportions initially stipulated in the contract between a contractor and an entrepreneur might change afterwards uh, during the contract period. So conclusions, uh, from the perspective of the entire contract, uh, the average cost deviations of the routine, uh, road maintenance projects are larger compared to the other types of projects procured by road authority. If we look uh, particularly to our two cost categories, so average cost deviation of the other maintenance part is larger than the winter service part, which I have mentioned a bit earlier. And uh, not all factors that impact the cost deviations are under the road authority's control, uh, but managing with these issues might be conducted in more or less uh, effective ways. And the existence of difference among entrepreneurs suggests that uh, there is possibility for strategic price setting by entrepreneurs. The size of the possibility depends on the road authority's capacity to accurately identify the amount uh, of work needed in each maintenance area. And uh, the level of accurateness is imperative to constrain the price speculation possibilities. Uh, the existence of regional differences might uh, imply that the road authorities effort in eliminating the inefficiencies have varying progress uh, across regions. And the road authorities follow up of the ordered work is on the way to improve uh, because we've seen that the detailed registration of the ordered work is introduced by road authority in 2018. And uh, we also see that there is a need to introduce the new work methods to make use of uh, the follow-up information to better analyze and plan the procurement process, for instance, in preparing the tender request documentation. And the last one is a road authorities tool to impede the price speculation and eventually impact the final costs are insufficient thus reaching the cost efficiency would be a challenging task for road authority. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this extremely interesting uh, case study and, um, and uh, presentation. So now I will open up the floor for 
questions or comment on these two presentations? Maybe I could start with a bit of a more general coming back to, to the issue on, on competences and skills. And from what I uh, understand also from your presentation, I think the Swedish National Audit Office since a couple of, started a couple of years ago to sort of realize that uh, the organization needed more of, of, of uh, quantitative analysis, regression analysis, and other thought, you know, things of methodology, and also have been, been quite determined also to recruit persons with, with other and new competences. How has this been sort of um, uh, received within the organization? Uh, is there, could this sort of uh, very strategic recruitment also create some kind of, of uh, uh, tensions within the organization and how to cooperate between, uh, as I heard you in Sweden, you call them quants, your quantare. <laughs> I mean, the, the cooperation between people with maybe your background and, and uh, staff with more have traditional sort of audit, uh, qualitative um, analysis methodology. It would be very interesting if you could elaborate a little bit. Uh, yes, that, that is uh, true. Uh, we, have, uh, we have had uh, more uh, new rec recruits than usual with the quantitative uh, skill set. Uh, and uh, there is there is uh, some uh, some challenge in uh, getting the most out of these new uh, uh, co-workers uh, because uh, they are already very qualified and they come from different ways but now they have to adhere to a very uh, strict format that we work in because we, we're interested in uh, what what is the state doing here what should the state do I mean, we don't just look at the problem, we look at uh, the problem from the perspective of the state and we have our audit questions and audit criteria to guide us to the right place to make it into a performance audit. Uh, and the, these, new, uh, uh, the, these new people who are recruited, they can often need some help to, uh, to write, uh, to make the study uh, from the right uh, perspective and uh, in the right format, uh, and they so they need to be a, a bit uh, like uh, humble about this and realize that uh, they just this part of the work they need some relearning and the old co-workers they also need to be a bit humble and say that uh, here comes these new people, we have to really make use of this and uh, cooperate in a good way. Uh, and I think the best way to do, do this is when you uh, put together the project groups, uh, pick two people who might work well together. And uh, I mean, they are smart people, they will probably figure it out. But uh, do, don't just leave someone sitting alone and doing their own thing like they always did. Uh, we have to uh, challenge ourselves to really cooperate instead. Uh, that way we can uh, overcome this challenge. Okay, thank you for that. Very interesting. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. I think you have a question along those lines uh, because I think it's very interesting to use an econometric model uh, in our uh, research, but I was wondering how do you translate the results in this specific case to uh, ad an advice for, um, for government? Because I think it's, I was also wondering about the explanatory power of the model. How strong are those? Because they are significant, but that is, uh, could you give, give an indication about how much variance is explained by the factors that you could include in your model? Sharsul, would you like to take that? Thank you for the interesting question. Yes, uh, the, the whole purpose was uh, to identify those uh, factors that uh, significantly impact the cost deviations. And uh, as you have seen from the presentation, so we have uh, discovered that uh, there are some uh, entrepreneur effects uh, which impact on the model. And uh, we, uh, our hypothesis was that uh, this is 
die to the possibility for price speculation, which we have found uh, by looking into the additional analysis, which I also presented uh, of these three contracts. And uh, we also identified that there are regional differences in cost deviations, which also shows that the road authority have varying progress in uh, their uh, work with coping with inefficiencies. So we have left these uh, results to the road authority and they should uh, probably uh, consider uh, from their perspective how they would uh, reflect that in their uh, everyday uh, activity. Sorry, just a follow-up because I think that's very interesting and very uh, not, uh, good to hear, but I was wondering, could you give an indication about the variance, how much you could explain of the difference you, that you saw in the um, the cost um, increases uh, in your model, because that gives an indication how much you could explain and how uh, important are the other factors which you could not include. So I'm quite is because that's always very important. That's why uh, we're struggling with the same issues. So that's why I'm wondering how you uh, what your results were. Uh, yes, uh, the explanatory power, power of the model R squared was about seventy percent. So and uh, we. From the beginning, we had a higher ambition to include the possible factors, but the road authority's uh, follow-up uh, register was uh, not in, uh, in that form which we would like to have. Uh, so therefore, there we have uh, uh, lowered our ambitions regarding the data request. So, and uh, after conducting all these uh, specification tests, we have. Uh, landed in this model and uh, this model's explanatory power is 70 percent i think uh, for the panel data methods uh, uh, it would be a pretty f pretty okay uh, but uh, yeah we have been uh, constrained by data availability as well thank you okay all right eric uh, i could just uh, to your first uh, question uh, uh, e even though we get some strong indications from the regression analysis, uh, it's, uh, there is always a risk that you uh, misinterpret your results or something. So uh, it's just one leg of the evaluation, although it's the biggest leg by far, but there, there are also our more traditional audit methods uh, with uh, um, analyzing documentation and uh, making interviews and stuff to like to, uh, uh, to to get that kind of knowledge also and put side by side uh, so we have those parts yes. okay peter welsh uh, I, I think i think we've got onto the subject really uh, I, i'm very pleased to see an example of people using regression analysis and i wish we used it much more often um i'm also also a little bit cautious because I know that if you start in t integrating lots of factors into your regression analysis it will appear to explain a lot of the variation but this could just be a mathematical artifact it doesn't necessarily reflect um, reflect a, a causal relationship between the, the factors you're investigating and, and the outcomes um, but it, it's, it's good to see it and I, I imagine it was a good feeling for the audit team to show that the simple explanation of the road authority as to why there is variation on was not an adequate explanation whatsoever. And I, th and I think that's one of the great things that, you know, that auditors can achieve if they make good use of evaluation techniques. So congratulations on that. Uh, we also have a question from UK. Uh, the presentation shows that the Swedish National Audit Office includes evaluation techniques in its performance audits. Does it also measure the impact of a program um, or a policy? And is it possible for you to sort of relate this example to, to this question? Impact. Uh, in this actual project, we don't study the impact. Uh, this is actually one, I would say this audit is very much on the economy side of things. Uh, 
uh, which is uh, makes it a minority. So we ha we haven't had that kind of data about the impact here, uh, but uh, but it's I can say that it's in our quantitative studies it's more common to look at the impact maybe make uh, effect studies with control groups or whatever you might be interested in in, a, in other areas uh, so that's more common than this type of uh, study where we only look at the economy part question from me what was the reaction so far from from the ODT from the road agency because one could imagine that this kind of analysis actually they could do it themselves so how has the reaction been uh, they they had a bit of a quiet reaction they they accepted the results and uh, they they found it pretty interesting and some things they already knew of course but they some things they found quite interesting okay. yes okay thank you very much i think we have to move on to to um, um, the next point on the agenda and the charlotte Turnerling, you have led performance audits in the area of rural development at the court and also on the opinion of the proposal for the cap legislation for the next uh, multi-financial framework um, so please make your presentation Thank you very much. Um, I will try to keep it a little bit shorter so that we still have some time for discussion towards the end uh, and tie things together. Um, and I won't go into so much detail um, as our Swedish colleagues did here. Um, we reflected a little bit uh, from our side here at the court uh, on, on which tasks and type of publications where evaluation methods could be, uh, could be used or are used. And uh, I'll talk about some examples that we found uh, from our, um, our chamber where we have done that and conclude with some final thoughts. Now, um, just to um, recap where we are from now, we are uh, from chamber one, um, Peter, my director, and I here, um, and we are doing um, audits on the common agriculture policy, environmental audits, and climate-related audits. So that's the areas that we're looking at. And... Um, we have a lot of different types of publication in the court in general. So we have, um, uh, in addition to uh, annual reports, opinion special reports, uh, we also have uh, landscape reviews, and uh, rapid case reviews, briefing papers, so a lot of different products in addition to uh, performance audits. And uh, we think that there, uh, there's a, a lot of scope of take a, uh, to take into account evaluations, especially in the review products, and, and we do that a lot as well. Um, and if you look at the tasks uh, of the European Court of Auditors, um, there are particularly two of them that are pertinent, I think, in the um, area of evaluations. Uh, we deliver opinions um, at the bottom um, uh, circle that I highlighted there, and we uh, examine whether EU policies and programs reach their objectives. Now, if we um, stop a little bit at objectives. We're also trying to figure out so what is the difference indeed between performance audit and objectives. And uh, when preparing and reflecting um, before this conference, and also uh, listening to our French colleague uh, from the Cour um, de uh, this morning, one of the key differences seems to be uh, the objectives. So uh, in, a, in an evaluation, you would rather challenge the objectives, which in performance audit you often take the objectives as a starting point for your audit to see if they have been achieved. Now we also reflect a little bit on that and now this example is now for the common agriculture policy um, specifically. So we are at the top we of course have EU objectives and political priorities which we as the EU's independent um, auditor uh, should, should not uh, challenge um, maybe but we also have a lot of other objectives because it's drizzled down we have the cap objectives both in the treaty and in the legislation then we also have rural development programs where each member state set um, their own objectives and we have at the lowest level we have project objectives so whereas, whereas we might not challenge in a performance audit the the higher level objectives we can uh, challenge the consistency between the objectives and I think we many times do also challenge the objectives of a specific project and if it fits into the uh, um, the higher policy objectives. Um, 
then, um, so in, in preparation of this um, conference, we, uh, we reflected a bit on um, where we, we have used evaluation techniques, and we have said, well, we have not performed any, any evaluations as such, uh, um, but, uh, but there are definitely areas where we have used uh, techniques, and one of them is, uh, I think, when we assess the Commission's uh, CAP proposal. So just to take a step back and, and uh, look at what is an uh, opinion. An opinion, well, first of all, we are, um, we're not a political body. We have the external auditors. We're also a supreme audit institution, here, so we know what that means. But uh, I think ECA maybe might have a little bit slightly different role than uh, um, the uh, um, National Audit Offices. Um, we can uh, deliver opinions uh, on uh, legislative proposals and uh, the opinion that uh, we prepared recently uh, was based along, uh, around our uh, um, program logic model which is very similar to what uh, um, the uh, Intosite Government for 100 uh, guidelines um, describe and um, uh, however this uh, assessment was uh, was an ex, ex ante assessment since we looked at the legislative proposal and what we did is that we uh, we developed um, different criteria I won't go uh, I want to go through them um, all now but what we see is that we have um, when we look at the objectives of an evaluation uh, in the intersite of uh, we have the planning and efficiency to ensuring there is a justification for a policy and that resources are efficiently deployed and the accountability. These were areas that we looked at when we assessed the, um, the legislative proposal and some of the things that we found uh, was when it came, uh, came to the needs and here we also took into account the Commission's impact assessment that it did uh, when preparing the legislative proposal. Um, we found that, uh, the, um, in our view, some areas uh, of the proposed spending were not sufficient, sufficiently justified. Um, we also looked, uh, for example, at the, the inputs and uh, found that uh, they are not uh, the, the EU funds are not allocated on the basis um, uh, of a needs uh, EU-wide needs assessment, and also the co-financing is not um, reflecting EU added value. So we thought that we think that the um, the uh, um, funds could be allocated more more efficiently. Another thing we also looked at uh, was whether there is a coherent framework. So we looked at uh, how we could link the inputs, results, and impacts. And we found that uh, the uh, policy objectives could not be clearly linked to the interventions. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it also meant then that the results and, and, and impacts would not be clear. So with this, um, the, this framework, performance framework that the Commission uh, uh, proposed, uh, uh, and as we might know now, uh, it's, it's in the, still in the legislative procedure, so we don't know what outcome will be, but our um, opinion here is that uh, it would not be sufficient to, um, to measure the results of the policy. We also looked at the specific indicators that the Commission proposed for evaluating uh, the, um, this policy, and we used our own definitions of input, output, results, and impact indicators uh, when we did that. And what we found is that um, many of the result, what the Commission then called result indicators, were what we would rather call output indicators. Um, just as an example uh, of result indicator in the proposal, here's the number of young farmers setting up a farm. So we thought a number of um, farmers is, 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 is not a result indicator, but rather uh, an output. Mm. Um, when it comes to the um, impact indicators, though, we found that they were generally um, quite good. Um, but um, it's, it was interesting to hear, listen this morning, also to hear that uh, talking about impact evaluations after one to three years, um, was what the Commission is proposing now is that the impact indicators they will only be assessed after the seven-year period. So it's true that certain policies take longer of course, to, to realize the, the impact, uh, but it also means that it will have a little impact on the way that these funds are managed. And, and, and usually it's, um, or commonly is done also too late to be taken into account for the next 
um, um, cycle of, of the policy. Well, the EU is operating in seven year cycles. Uh, so um, that's for the, um, for the CAP opinion. And then I would also like to mention just a few examples of how we uh, have used um, evaluation techniques in our performance audits. We have um, we we have it as one of our audit methods. We have a benchmarking, for example, is used as a method to collect and analyze audit evidence. This is how our evidence collection plan looks like, and it's one of the um, um, uh, methods that we can use. My first example is from the uh, uh, special report that we published on young farmers, uh, where we looked at um, startup aid uh, to young farmers to start a viable farm business. And um, I will just um, show you one example of an analysis that we made, um, which um, we, um, well, I think it's um, one could call it benchmark, and that's what we did, but it's also a bit of a counterfactual analysis when we divided farmers in different groups. So we compared those that received aid to those that did not receive aid. Uh, and this was based on secondary data, so we received the um, uh, ex post evaluation report from uh, from ODTs, but uh, we analysed it and found uh, and found here that um, that the results were better for those that had received the EU funding than those that had not. So it's just an example of how we can use it in our, those techniques in our audit, and and definitely we have used more advanced techniques as well. But um, here's a. Another one which is even um, simpler, one could say, but it's um, related more to the methodology uh, um, or sorry, the, the process of implementing a, a policy. So um, looking at simplification, we had a, a special report on simplified cost options. Um, and one of the questions related to uh, was it really simplifying uh, life for, for, for farmers, for beneficiaries and for the national authorities? So what we did is that we compared periods, so before and after introducing the simplified cost options. And of course here it was also important to look at projects that were uh, um, similar enough to, to exclude other factors influencing um, these factors. But we looked at, uh, in the green uh, figures here we see, we looked at the applications for support that the beneficiaries um, applicants submit. We looked at the payment claims and we looked at, the, looked at the administrative checks. And we looked for the applications, we looked at the number of documents submitted, so it was really quantitative um, yeah. analysis there. And, but we also looked uh, uh, for the um, uh, number of documents uh, checked and the number of checks, um, as well as the extent of the checks and the time needed um, for this, um, and we found um, we found indeed that uh, uh, um, this was uh, uh, actually uh, this is actually a picture from from Sweden. It doesn't <laughs> doesn't matter, but uh, um, where we found that uh, the the big uh, bunch of paper sticking out there was uh, redundant in the uh, you, w when using a, a flat rate for for indirect costs for certain product um, projects. So in this case, we found that it was easier and uh, saving time during the administrative checks. Um, so I was speeding, speeding it up a little bit here so that we have some um, time for discussion. Um, now what I will do though is to summarize with some final thoughts. And um, well, what we should do, uh, uh, or what, and what we do is to make use of evaluations done. I'm, when I looked, I looked at, uh, or. We looked at here at ECA what kind of guidance do we have. We don't have guidance on evaluations as such, um, but we have an audit guideline. Uh, well, we have an audit guideline on evaluation, but it's rather how we uh, can assess evaluations and so on, and it's actually available on our external website as well. Uh, I think we do that, and we do it also when we select and plan audits, as well as we can use evaluations if we have a system, we can use them also as, as audit evidence or as corroboration to our audit evidence that we are gathering. We already uh, we discussed uh, uh, or a little bit about the multiple levels of policy objectives, which then um, in this sense can make the question, um, which is generally an evaluation question, 
um, about um, is, um, is this relevant, is this objective relevant. Uh, it makes it pertinent to, to, to us as well when we have several levels of, of policy objectives. Um, and then there are, of course, benefits of evaluation techniques when you use the main performance um, audit, uh, such as we can have more quantitative or um, perceived as more objective assessments. But um, uh, one of the things we have seen is, uh, is that, the, the, in this case, the European Commission has, as uh, our audit team, Marine ODT, has a quite a extensive evaluation framework um, with some um, challenges when it comes to, or gaps when it comes to quality symptoms, mainly depending on uh, lack of uh, or um, uh, well, challenges related to availability and, and reliability of, uh, of data. And, and this is, of course, something that, uh, that we can face sometimes as well if, if we uh, um, intend to use uh, evaluation techniques. So that kind of summarizes what I wanted to say here, and I will then leave the floor to discussion. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for, for this presentation. Uh, I don't know, Peter, would you like to um, also say something maybe about the, the challenges for the, for the on the uh, on the uh, availability and reliability of of, uh, of data do we face particular difficulties when it comes to sort of shared management and also looking what impact uh, do the the eu funds or the eu programs have in the member states yes um, i was thinking as i listened to our swedish colleagues whether there is a certain syndrome of learned helplessness with um, some audit clients that they don't always gather the information that they prefer not to know um, and so when you go and ask yourself the question whether this policy is really working there are some essential pieces of information that you'd expect a client to have like the baseline like knowing where you start from um, which, which they you know, they may not be collecting, which makes things um, really sig significantly more difficult. And I, and I think a starting point for, for the way we think about evaluation in, in lots of things we look at is, is to ask ourselves you know, very straightforward questions about what, what the client is doing, what the commission is doing. Um, we, we habitually look at um, impact assessments which should take place before any policy is put forward. Um, in the past, we've tended in the court to report on that as a sort of subject on its own, which I think is a valid thing to do. Um, listening to the presentations today, I'm, I'm asking myself the question whether we bring that enough into our reports on individual topics. Um, there's an evaluation technique that we use virtually un universally. We look to see if there's a program logic model or something underlying a policy. That's part of our planning process. Um, it was put there. I'm old enough to remember. It was put there to, to, you know, to open us up to, to the evaluation topics. I notice that habitually we find there is not a program logic model underlying this intervention. And we deal with this by drawing up our own sort of shadow program logic model. This is the way we think the client thinks that the program works. Um, I'm not sure that we often enough turn that in, into a recommendation. And I, and I think these sort of lacunae are pointing to, to reasons why we don't always get all the information um, that we're looking for. Um, I, thought the, um, I thought Stephen's presentation with a, an example of taking publicly available data, taking census data, taking business statistics. Um, I, I mean, that is something we've done, but have we done enough of it? Because, you know, when you start getting into this, then, then you overcome the, the problems that people have not collected things specifically um, for your, for your programme. Uh, but on your specific question, is it worse for shared management or direct management? I don't know. Because it's not great in direct management either. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so so I I, I think that there, there is a there is a challenge for us with, with data. I think that the challenge is obviously lots of member states collect relevant information, but they may collect it in different ways. Um, we are doing something at the moment on CAP income stabilisation, where some of the member states collect really quite good information, 
Um, France does, Italy does, um, and yet the information that is available at the Commission is much more restricted and is much more sort of how, what, what share of farmers are doing this. Um, uh, the, there is a danger as we try and use evaluation techniques that we end up talking about the lack of information. And lack of information is, is a valid point, but I think what our, what our readers really want is us to, to get behind what the, what the data could show and to, to offer some views on whether this, this policy is significant in terms of, you know, is it, having a, is significantly effective, is uh, reasonably efficient. Um, and actually, I, I think that this evaluation question of, of, of relevance that um, was included in the uh, Court of Comptes uh, presentation, I think it's, I think it's, it's very relevant for us. I mean, I think, I think it's something that we really need to, to, to deal with. And um, in the Young Farmers report, I thought we were getting into, into the relevance issue for, for some of those interventions. So sorry, that's a, that's a long reply. Thank you very much. So I'm sure that all these presentations have uh, inspired you and I, I'm, I'm convinced that there are some questions. So let's open up the, the sort of the more general discussion. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for all these presentations that we've heard. And I would like to ask questions to the colleagues, to our guests that have come here. I believe that there is one thing is using evaluative methods in standard audit. That is something that we do or we want to do more. But the other question is the true purpose of the evaluation as it is set in the standard or in the guideline. To which extent does one want to go and say that the policy is not performing as it is or it's bad, even go being that bold as saying it is bad. To which extent are you mandated to say so? by law, this might be a very difficult political question, administratively difficult, you know, cultures are different, and to which extent do you actually do it in your countries? So not only doing the work evaluating, but giving the recommendation, as Peter said, and being that bold and saying something of true value. Thank you. Excellent question. So who is bold enough to start to answer that? <laughs> Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, indeed, it's a bold mission to go as far as questioning the utility, the, the relevance of uh, public policy and the action of the government. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it is one of the core mission of the Cour des Comptes uh, in France to ensure and to evaluate uh, public policies. It is written in the Constitution uh, following the 2008 uh, constitutional uh, reform uh, and it has been one of the uh, uh, of the work of the Cour des Comptes since, uh, since then to, to implement that. So we have a clear mandate and other sides uh, have also uh, a mandate uh, either in, uh, written in the constitution or uh, in the law. Uh, our questionnaire on the implementation of the InterSci Gov actually asked this question asked, uh, do you have, do, do your side have a mandate to conduct evaluation? And the answer was that uh, most of them have either, uh, it is either written in the constitution or they have uh, some, um, some elements in the law that can either lead to uh, evaluation or be understanding as uh, doing evaluation, for instance, uh, in the during the presentation of the ECA, it was not uh, specifically say, saying that uh, the ECA can conduct evaluation, but it can question the objective of uh, a policy. So uh, this is uh, an understanding of what an evaluation is. Very good. Anyone else? Strange question. <laughs> Do we can we say that the policy doesn't work? But I think it w you, you must consider the institutional setting of your institution. The, you are comparing countries. Maybe it's more difficult to say what works or what does not work. But I think it's in our mandate, and the Parliament is waiting that to say, well, this policy which is implementing through the, the, the administration does not work. 
Maybe it's because of the legislation which does, does not work. So we can also say in certain, the legislation is not okay for uh, um, achieving these results. Uh, anyway, we cannot criticize legislation which is very recent. But all the legislation since 10 years, or when you have technological uh, changement or uh, new elements, I think it's in our job to say, no, the policy doesn't work because the legislation is too old, or, and I think it, it will be accepted by the parliament and by the, the government. But, well, it's, it's our, in our uh, institutional setting, we do have also cantons, we are a federalistic country. Of course, when we make benchmarking about from cantons, it's not so very, it's not very easy to do it and to say this canton is better than the other canton. But we try to do it, maybe sometimes we don't, con we don't write which canton it is, but we make a uh, comparison without, uh, uh, with numbers instead of uh, um, uh, designing the canton. There are plenty of factors, but normally it's our job in an audit office or to, to criticize uh, a policy or, um, or uh, uh, the implementation of a policy. Thank you very much for that. Stephen, please. There are two good examples, I think, of GAO doing this that I'd like to share. One is through that fragmentation, overlap, and duplication work that I talked about earlier, we often find programs that are doing similar things or the same things. Um, and when is the case like for um, one was the US Family Health Program, which is an insurance program run by the Department of Defense. They also have a bigger program called TRICARE, which is also an insurance program. GAO went in, we found they provided about the same services. Satisfaction was a little bit higher in this smaller specialized program, but the cost was much higher. And we determined that that cost wasn't worth the change in satisfaction, given that the services provided were actually the same. So we recommended to eliminate uh, the US Family Health Program in, in one of our reports. Um, a better example, though, I think, is we looked at uh, the Transportation Security Administrations, you know, the people who baggage check at the airports, um, a program called SPOT, which is something they use to look for folks who may be suspicious or dangerous or potential terrorist targets um, in the airports. And what we found was we reviewed a wide range of studies and found that there was no evidence that this program or the behaviors that were being used or looked for had any actual um, evidentiary component that said they were effective. And because they couldn't prove any effectiveness, we recommended that they stop funding that program until they could either demonstrate an impact um, or until they could revise it in such a way that they used um, other behaviors that did demonstrate an impact. Thank you. Two very, very good examples, I think. Peter, what is My view is that policy in the EU gets, as, as Charlotte explained, gets expressed at lots of levels. And um, I think if you get to the very top level, it's hard for us to say, you know, that the the policy of the EU is set out in the policy objectives of the EU is set out in the treaties, um, in really major um, documents. Uh, I think it would be hard for us to question that, question the objectives. Um, but then there's all these subsidiary levels, and then then we have the the, the point that Madame Lamarck made early on: is there a conflict between the different policy instruments? Are they are they actually all pointing in the in the same direction? And there's one which plays on my mind in Chamber One quite a lot, a lot of the time is we, we have objectives which, um, we have policies which aim to, let's say, um, achieve some desirable social benefit, but they also have climate impacts. And how do we, you know, how, how do you square those? Um, and, and we have in the past been fairly brave on this at times, um, I mean, not on that, that issue, but I, I recall 10 or 11 years ago we did a report on, on spending on public health, which ended with the question that the Commission should consider whether this was a good use of EU resources, whether the, the role was, uh, of the EU was so central that it, it made sense to, to spend uh, money on this. Um, and I think when we ask this question that we ask, often ask ourselves about European value added, we are effectively asking a question about whether this should be spent, should be funded by the European budget or, or by someone else's budget. And I you know, I think that's pretty much in your area. And that's a, that's a concept we're fairly familiar with. 
Very good. Uh, and uh, I fully agree on what has been said that I think, uh, of course, if something is not functioning, it's important for the auditors to be very open uh, with this, to say this policy isn't working, this legislation isn't working as, as intended. And maybe also from a sort of personal reflection, I think all Supreme Audit institutions from time to another are accused for being too political. I mean, you shouldn't be accused every week. <laughs> But from time to time, and I think if you're not accused for this, I think you are too cautious, actually. So we have a question from Belgium, two questions, really. One from the, to the uh, European Court of Auditors and one to, to, to maybe the Supreme Audit Institutions in, in member states. A question for the European Court of Auditors. Evaluations of the Commission often focus on outputs and to a lesser extent on results. The citizen wants to know what public funds have brought to them. Uh, would this be something for the European auditors? Would, wouldn't that uh, better show the usefulness of EU expenditures? And maybe a little bit provocative. Are we, are we doing the right things? And the second question is, to what extent do member states evaluate the EU expenditures? So are we focusing on the right things at the European Court of Auditors? I don't know, Danielle, would you like to comment on that question? Oh, many of our reports um, insist on the fact that uh, evaluation within the EU, within the Commission, is mainly focused on outputs, outcomes, uh, not enough outcomes, and very rarely uh, uh, results. Uh, so that's probably a challenge for EU funds evaluation to increase uh, our capacity and the Commission capacity and the member states' capacity as well to insist more on the question of outcomes that means uh, something for citizens. What is the added value of Europe? Within the, within the countries, what we can see is that in many countries, in fact, uh, evaluation made by the the obligation of evaluation imposed by the Commission after the 90s um, helped to develop uh, evaluation culture within our member states because they were obliged to, to evaluate the structural funds and that may help them build uh, capacity in evaluation. But uh, what we can see too is that this evaluation is very often separate from evaluation of other policies in the different in different units. So the question of disseminating uh, this culture of evaluation within the member states after uh, this uh, this trigger made by the Commission is still a challenge for evaluation in, a, in our country. So evaluation, development of evaluation of EU funds would mean probably more cooperation between, between the Commission and member states and cooperation between the, the, the size themselves and the different evaluation units within the, within the countries because the evaluation is mainly ordered by the Commission and uh, monitored by the Commission through uh, private firms and pro most probably science could be more involved in, uh, in these issues. Thank you very much. And the other question, do member states evaluate EU expenditure? Who would like to take the floor on that? Uh, it happens uh, that we <coughs> eval evaluate uh, EU funding uh, if uh, the state is involved by uh, distributing or using the funds. Uh, sometimes we have done uh, joint audits with, uh, uh, with the audit offices of other member states uh, on the same issue. Uh, but, but the cases I know of uh, that we have done, I think that they are maybe not, um, not, not really what we are talking about here with uh, evaluation where we try to look at the impact and say a little bit more. I, I can't recall any of those types of studies uh, concerning EU funds. Yes. So, so it's more on the, on the question of internal control or having, if the rules have been followed, more, more of compliance. Yes. Okay. What about other Supreme Audit institutions? How much do you do on, on, on EU funds? I'm not exactly sure, but I don't. I know we only look at it when also uh, government, so government look, yeah, 
central government funding is involved. So we look at it entirely, not only if projects are funded entirely uh, separately by the European Union. That's all I know. It's not my field of expertise because I think it's the same in the Netherlands. It's mostly compliance and less on performance audit or evaluation. Okay, other questions or comments? I was thinking about one thing that we have not touched upon, at least not so much today, uh, in relation to methodologies and, and also more of quantitative analysis. What um, opportunities do you see from your respective organization using new um, new technologies, big data. We know, for example, when it comes to financial audit, that um, at least the big four audit firms, they are investing hugely right now in, in uh, 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 robotics and artificial intelligence. How can we use new technologies uh, uh, in, in when it comes to performance audit and when it comes to evaluation? It, it's, it's something that interests me a great deal. Um, if I'm thinking about the environmental impact of agricultural policies, for example, um, at the moment we have a sort of a bottom-up collection process for this with individual projects telling, telling the Commission what they think they've achieved. And you could, sort, you could be a little bit cynical about this and imagine that they don't always um, you know, put the, the biggest attention on, on, on the things that have... Um, that have not been achieved or have gone badly. Um, I think the great opportunity for us is, is much greater use of satellite data, satellite imagery, um, and probably that coupled with the use of artificial intelligence so that you get, um, you, you get I mean, let's say if you can put satellite imagery, um, some on, on the ground work in terms of sampling soil, sampling waters, um, and, and put that use artificial in intelligence on that, you could get some, I, I think, you know, fantastically interesting um, results. I mean, already, th you know, how much of Europe is covered by forest? Are, are forests shrinking or, or are they growing? Things like that you can already answer. But I think in, 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 the, in the future, we'll be able to answer many more questions. So there's great opportunities there and massive costs. So, you know, probably, possibly what we will want to do is to encourage our clients to develop very quickly in this area so that we can use their data rather than having to, having to launch our own satellites. But, uh. uh, Stephen, what is your opinion? So the GAO has recently recognized this as, a, as an important area. The applied research and methods team that I'm a part of, um, one of our other centers was uh, the Center for Engineering um, Science science technology and engineering and they've actually recently along with some other parts of GAO um, been broken into a new team uh, STAA the science technology and audit audit and assessment science technology assessment and audit um, lab uh, team and they are breaking in both of these on one hand they do technology assessments which are looking at areas like robotics AI big data um, you can find some of those technology assessments on GAO's uh, website there's a few of them out there but those look at the social political legal economic uh, implications of new and emerging technologies um, and are seeking more and more to design policy options for for legislators to think about how they might consider these technologies and policy moving forward um, but in related to that for performance audits and evaluation that team is also going to constitute something called an audit innovation lab where we're going to look at these technologies like machine learning through text analytics, uh, potentially blockchain somewhere down in the future, or big data as ways to enhance our audits, improve our evaluations, think about things like using big data to identify improper payments and potential fraud um, and all that kind of stuff. And so we're working very deliberately to try and develop that capacity and to try and build some of those new technologies into our audit processes. Okay, that sounds really interesting. I think this is also an area where we could uh, share uh, uh, experience and, and, and uh, good examples because I think uh, this is difficult. This is a new area. We also in, in this we need, we need new skills, but also that it offers uh, opportunities to, to go deeper into sort of what are the results of, of different programs. Any comments on this from this side? I would like to add that we're also looking at ways because the machine learning is also done by departments. So how do you audit that? How do you audit algorithms? That's one area what we're looking at. And we also uh, 
looking at ways to uh, working with big data. We have recently done a study with data from the tax office with millions of records, and it is very insightful. It was a very interesting study, but you also run into a lot of complications because if you do one run with a model, it's half a day. If, if you make an error, it's again half a day. So there's all kinds of new issues uh, emerging from uh, working with the big data and things like machine learning. We're still uh, finding ways uh, uh, to, to deal with it. Okay, any final questions? No? Then it's just for me to thank the panelists. I think we have had an extremely interesting morning. I think I've learned a lot. Uh, we will now break up for lunch and we will resume at 2 o'clock. Yes, we'll resume at 2 o'clock. So thank you to all participants, panelists, audience uh, for this very interesting contribution and questions. Uh, those who are interested by the presentation, you will be able to find them. They will be available on the website of the conference. Uh, and we resume at 2 o'clock sharp after the, the, the lunch break. Thank you very much.